Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Attila Bercik. Warm welcome on the very first coordinator day for Cluster 6 projects under Horizon Europe. This is also our first event we are broadcasting from uh, the Commission's Research Department TV studio. This event is recorded. You will be able to watch it later on. In our website, uh, we already published material for you. We have a really uh, well-packed agenda. I will be your host today. My name is Attila Bercik on behalf of the European Research Executive Agency. After the opening, uh, we will have uh, three more uh, uh, thematic sessions. Uh, we will cover the key aspects. Uh, before jumping in the middle, um, I invited uh, two prominent representatives from our agency with whom uh, I will have a, a little uh, discussion. Before there, I would like to uh, highlight that we want to make this event as interactive as possible. Therefore, we created a Slido session for you. You can access it uh, as indicated on the slide. You can pose there your questions. We have a dedicated team there to answer your questions and of course the most relevant questions we will read out aloud and answer here during the session. Please use uh, the code coordinators day uh, 2022 and enter there. In order to make a warm up, I already invite you to participate in the poll. We are very much interested to learn where are you from, from which country you are uh, representing. Uh, we will see the results later on. And now this is the moment that uh, I'm able to uh, introduce uh, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Paul Webb, Head of Department, uh, Department B, Green Europe Research Executive Agency. With Paul, uh, we share now some experience working together. Paul uh, used to work before joining the agency in the research department and before that uh, for a decade in the uh, agriculture department of the commission in various posts uh, and we also worked together. Uh, I had the pleasure with, uh, for working with him on uh, financial matters and control. Good morning, Paul. I'm glad to see you here. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Uh, Paul, uh, Referring back to the fact that this is the first event uh, uh, in uh, this series of coordinators days, I think it is worth uh, framing a bit uh, and introducing first maybe who we are. Could you please uh, introduce our department, who we are and what we are doing, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks very much. Um, so the Research Executive Agency is one of several agencies um, established by the European Commission to implement European research program and indeed other programs, particularly implementation. How do we go about uh, organizing contracts and, and paying money? Uh, my department, Department B in Rare Green Europe, is particularly involved in the implementation of Cluster 6 of Horizon Europe, as well as the predecessors of Horizon 2020, even FB7, also the Research Fund for Coal and Steel and Agricultural Promotion Scheme. We're about 150 people. Very gender balanced, actually, not like uh, the panel here at the moment, but um, uh, great colleagues who really want to help you to implement your projects as well as we possibly can. I'm very proud of the way they do that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, moving to the program itself, Horizon Europe, uh, now it's uh, one in the series of framework programs, RNI framework programs uh, in the EU. Could you please elaborate a little bit about uh, uh, how the big political goals, the big tickets uh, are linked to the program and, in, and to the program structure? Uh, we have a lot of newcomers. I think this is worth to elaborate a bit, please. Yeah, absolutely. So we have the biggest uh, research funding program in the world and uh, you know, we're, we're proud of that. But it has been very much, right from the beginning, integrated in the main policies of the Commission, the main initiatives of the Commission. And that you'll see in the, in the structure of the way that things are set out and health and digital, security and so on. And in our particular area, Cluster 6, linked to the Green Deal. And the Green Deal covers a whole range of areas around biodiversity and nature and agriculture, aquaculture and so on. But the whole program, the whole of Cluster 6 and the whole of our work program is designed to feed into these major policy initiatives. So you'll see that as you go through 
first of all, your application process, but also through the research process and what we're looking at, what we're looking at from you is all linked to the policies that we are trying to implement all around the Green Deal. And I think that's been, it did exist before, but I think that's been a major effort in Horizon Europe to make sure that that's really clear. And you'll hear a lot about that today as we go on. Moving a bit deeper in the program, uh, missions are mentioned very often these days, they're very high in the political agenda. Uh, could you please explain in plain words what missions are? And in particular, there is one distinct mission in our portfolio, the soil mission, if you could introduce it in a few words. So the whole basis behind missions is that research is good. Research is great. It's not enough in itself. Uh, and we know that research does lead to change. Of course, it leads to change. But perhaps we are not doing enough as policymakers, as research funders, to make sure that this link is really made. And that's the idea with missions. It will start. There will be research. There is a work, uh, a work program for the missions. But what we really want to do is to make extra efforts to make sure that the results of this, mission, uh, of this research are taken up in the real world. And if you look at the soil mission, I'm really delighted that finally soil has been given the importance it deserves. People have really understood the degradation of our soil and what we need to do. But what we're really going to try in the soil mission is to link the research with the reality on the ground. Doing a lot of exercises together with local authorities, with farmers, with local people citizens and so on, to just to try and make sure that we can really use the research to have an effect on the ground. And what you'll see in this mission is a whole range of large demonstration projects, I think they're called lighthouses, where we would take a certain area and try to put into practice what we found out from the research. So that's really the idea with the mission, is to make sure that we take research and we really make efforts to go beyond it. And I think that's really the important difference from uh, things that we've seen in the past. We promised uh, when we announced this event that uh, we will give advice uh, to our beneficiaries how to manage project and how to turn the project a real success. Now, uh, moving to a more personal view, opinion and advice, um, could you share your view? What makes a project successful? be on the baseline when we talk about uh, completing it, uh, submitting reports, uh, reaching uh, milestones. Uh, how you see the success? Yeah. I think really increasingly we're saying, well, what are the results? What's happening next after you finish your, result, uh, your research? And I hope that you will be thinking about that even from the beginning. Where am I going to finish um, in what I'm doing? It's not the last day of the research is what's going to come after that. Uh, and I think one of the important things is, uh, is networking. Networking with the other projects working in the same area, and certainly we can help with that if you're not already doing it. It's trying to network with perhaps entrepreneurs, business people, local authorities in your own area to see how you can apply the results in your own area. And it's really trying to say, what do we learn in terms of our policy response? because we really want to make sure that we feed back from your results, your research results, into the European Union policies. And I think we are increasingly thinking about that, and I'd really ask you to think about that from the beginning, because that's what's going to make your research a success. Not the research itself, but what it's going to lead to after that. So I really would, would ask you to do that, and certainly my colleagues are really keen to help you to do that. And you will see as you go through various different initiatives that might come up to try to network you with other projects that are going on to make sure that we're getting a full picture of what's happening in your area, of the developments that we can make in a particular area. Indeed. Now moving to implementation and giving an advice to our beneficiaries. Uh, Paul, you have massive, tremendous experience in financial management, uh, ex-ante, ex-post control. Would you have a, a particular targeted advice to our beneficiaries uh, on these matters? What I've always said at this sort of event in the past is, we want to pay you what you should be paid. It's not our objective to 
to cut what you're paid, to reduce what you're paid, to recover money from you. We want you to achieve your results and we want to pay for it. And that's our basic, basic position and all the colleagues are right behind that. But we are spending taxpayers' money, you're spending taxpayers' money, and there are rules. Um, and you, know, you may think that the rules are, are not very good, but they're there and you need to respect them. So I'd really ask you to look carefully at what, you're, at what you are claiming. Look carefully at the rules. Look carefully at what you're claiming. And let's make sure that together we ensure that your cost claims are correct and we're paying you the right amount of money. And just the two big things for me, you're expected to keep timesheets. Please do it. Please do it. Otherwise, you're going to get into trouble at the end. And please, we work on a system of real costs. Please charge the real cost of the program, not some standard costs, invented costs, budgeted costs, and so on. If you stick to those two big things, you won't make big errors, and that's uh, really what I want to see. We, ha we do, from time to time, have to take back money from beneficiaries, sometimes large amounts of money. And we will do it if we need to, but really, we don't want to. Please help us to avoid that by reading the rules carefully, attending the different events like this one, and others that are set up by our colleagues in uh, the research department. Learn the rules, study the rules, get to know the way that things are done. Make sure you claim the right amount and we will be delighted to pay you what you deserve. Thank you, Paul. Uh, wrapping this little discussion up, uh, what would be your personal uh, message to our beneficiaries? I think get the back office right, get the administration right, get the cost claims right, make sure you know the rules. That's one thing that is absolutely essential. The second thing is please look outside your project to see who else you can work with. There are so many other things going on, uh, thinking about what you're going to do in the future. Please engage with your project officer uh, and the financial officers here at the Research Executive Agency. They are here to help. They are committed to helping. They really want to do it. Um, so please, if you do have doubts, please contact them and they will do everything that they can to help you. We really want to use your results uh, for the next stage of for learning, the next stage of research, for innovations, for changes to our policies. Um, please let's together make sure that we produce the best research we possibly can. Thank you very much, Paul, indeed, for this discussion. Please stay with us, uh, maybe to also see how and what questions we get. Uh, I refer back to the slide, though. Dear colleagues, uh, we had a poll. Where are you coming from? Uh, I turn to my colleagues to see the outcome. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the distribution is, is rather even. Uh, I welcome everyone from uh, the eastern border of Poland uh, down to Galway in Ireland. Uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, this is the moment again that I uh, ask you to fill in the second poll. Uh, it is all about experience. Could you please indicate to us uh, whether you are a newcomer to the program or you have some underlying experience coming from the past? This is very important because we will shape the content accordingly. And with this, now I turn uh, to my second guest. I have the honor to introduce Mr. Arnor Las Milukas, head of unit, uh, unit B3, uh, Biodiversity, Circular Economy, and environment in the research executive agency. Anas has more than 16 years underlying experience in the institutions uh, working at the commission's research department uh, before uh, joining the agencies and a lot of experience in program implementation. Uh, Anas before joining the commission uh, took part in the accession negotiation of his home country, Lithuania, to the EU. So he really has the wide angle of view. Uh, Arnas, good morning, welcome, and I already turn to you with my first question. Paul nicely introduced our department. Uh, now, how you see our practical role in program implementation and in linking those bold political initiatives uh, with the program implementation itself? Uh, thank you, Atla, for introduction and uh, question. And uh, uh, I would like first uh, to, to, to say good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I wish to 
congratulate all participants on being successful in a very competitive uh, call for proposals. And I am happy to see uh, so many of uh, you represented out of more than 300 freshly funded proposals in the cluster six. And uh, uh, no need to, to remind that uh, cluster six uh, uh, aims at implementation of the European Green Deal. And uh, uh, finding solutions to the environmental challenges that we are facing uh, today, uh, innovative ways uh, to switch to sustainable development uh, are among the most important uh, policy goals of the European uh, Commission. And as a representative from Research Executive Agency, I can summarize uh, our role in one word. We are enablers. And we ensure this smooth implementation uh, of the research and innovation framework programs. And uh, as Paul mentioned, not only Horizon Europe, but as well uh, legacy programs like Horizon 2020. And we help uh, funded beneficiaries to achieve their goals, uh, be it, uh, for example, reducing uh, environmental uh, degradation, halting and reversing decline of biodiversity, managing natural resources in a sustainable manner, or finding uh, innovative uh, solution in the agri-food uh, chain. Thank you, Arnas. Now, I think we gave a nice overarching picture who we are, what we are doing. Maybe it's time to also express what actually we expect from funded projects. Basically, uh, we expect uh, that uh, projects uh, will give the right means to science, uh, research and innovation uh, to develop tangible results that will have a positive impact on the life of citizens uh, through green solution, through job creation and a sustainable and healthy environment for living. And because you are the experts, uh, the innovators, the specialists, who have knowledge, uh, the science and creativity uh, to produce results. Uh, so we rely on your effort and commitment to implement uh, projects in the best uh, possible uh, ways and to make a real impact. And we are interested in your success and uh, ready to support you. Impact is the key word. Uh, leave an impact, create impact even way beyond the project. Now, uh, having this one and a half decade experience you have in prog uh, program implementation and project support, project management, could you please highlight some of the key success factors? The, I mean, I, those that are the subtle ones, the, the delicate ones that help making a project a real success, please. We cannot uh, emphasize enough uh, the importance of the role of the project uh, uh, coordinator. Uh, as a trivia, the project coordinator uh, has an ultimate role of the conductor of the orchestra and act as intermediary between the beneficiaries and their staff members. And uh, smooth interaction is uh, crucial. And I would encourage a project coordinator to stay in touch for every aspect of uh, your project implementation with the relevant uh, agency staff member. And equally important is a good internal arrangements and regular and sound uh, communication within the consortia regarding your cooperation and coordination to ensure that the action is uh, implemented properly. And it is essential for the uh, successful project execution. And we rely on your talent, uh, expertise, capacity and ability to work jointly as a team and you as a, a consortia uh, need to work really closely and in the spirit of good uh, collaboration. Thank you, Arnas. Um, I think you nicely said communication is gold, in particular when it goes uh, for establishing coherence uh, inside the project consortium. Now looking uh, beyond the project consortium itself, um, uh, 
would you have an advice on uh, interaction and communication beyond the project? And uh, I think this is a very interesting and relevant uh, question. Uh, in the previous framework programs, we often seen you know great uh, uh, project achievements and promising results that uh, were let's say poorly communicated, and it's something that uh, we really want to change. This is why uh, external communication is essential uh, part of your project, and this is not only basic obligation, but it's a massive opportunity for turning the project results uh, into a sustainable success. And excellent science uh, needs, uh, you know, uh, effective uh, communication and dissemination. And I strongly recommend uh, uh, each and every project uh, consortia to build a dedicated communication strategy. Uh, even to, this may to entail to building your own project uh, identity. And the project should go beyond the uh, direct stakeholders' uh, communities and aim at communicating the project results efficiently to the rest of the world and bringing research uh, uh, and its outcomes to the attention of non-scientific audiences, peers in the research community, potential investors and business partners or policy makers will foster collaboration and innovation. And strategic uh, communication and dissemination help to explain the wider societal relevance of science, uh, gain support for future research and innovation funding, to ensure uptake of results within the scientific uh, community and open up potential business opportunities uh, for novel products and services. I really encourage you to go beyond habitual communication and contribute to building and uh, strengthening public uh, trust in science and innovation. This topic is tremendous and extremely important. I would like just to echo your last words, uh, projects, and not only a program, entirely the whole project has a key role in engaging with the society and, and enhancing uh, public trust in science and innovation and recognizing and help recognizing the importance of this. Uh, Paul already mentioned networking, and I think everyone agrees that the power of networks in our contemporary life is extremely important and even gaining more importance. What would be your recommendation for our Cluster 6 projects regarding the use of networks and uh, developing uh, networks, maybe not only inside the project, but beyond? Yeah, indeed, you know, uh, the size and complexity of Horizon uh, Europe, uh, in my opinion, carries uh, its own uh, uh, massive opportunity for, the, uh, for your project, let's say, to zoom out, uh, because your project is a part of a bigger uh, research and innovation family. Uh, so we encourage you establishing uh, links as much as possible with other projects and beyond. And uh, most of you, of course, will have a uh, possibility to get in contact with the projects coming from your own call uh, and topic. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you should be aware about the other, let's say, uh, parts of the, of the work uh, program uh, through various clustering activities. Uh, so please take these opportunities to uh, maximize impact of your project and to pass uh, messages uh, to commission, which could be very useful for the policy making. Uh, one direction to start, uh, let's say, is to visit uh, Horizon Results Platform that you can, um, you can reach uh, via uh, the funding and tenders portal. And I can suggest as an excellent source of inspiration to take a look at the numerous successful projects already listed in the DGRNI website, uh, whose results have been uh, featured by international media and uh, many, let's say, other uh, commission communication uh, channels. Uh, the most successful projects will be invited uh, to engage in various events organized by the commission, like research and uh, uh, innovation days, like EU Green Week, uh, or they could be invited to join other international events with a uh, high visibility. 
at the end of this uh, introductory discussion, what would be your uh, brief uh, takeaway message to our beneficiaries? I think it will be a short one. Let's say so. Uh, most uh, natural please uh, use uh, um, opportunity today and uh, be proactive, ask uh, questions, and uh, as well in the in your daily uh, work during the whole life of your project, please stay in touch with your uh, project uh, officer. He's a or she is an ultimate uh, contact point, uh, and uh, she or he is here to help you and our officers are ready to, to guide you the whole project implementation uh, to provide you with a timely advice uh, to think together with you uh, about the creative solution during the challenging moments and, and to handle unforeseen changes so they say we are here to, to, to help you and as well, I would like to use this uh, occasion to wish all participants an interesting and fruitful coordination day. And thank you, Atla, for this opportunity to share some advice. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It was a great uh, moment to talk a little bit and give uh, insights about how we uh, work, how we look like, and what is our view. Uh, dear fellows, uh, it is the moment to uh, make a break. Before that, uh, I go back to the Slido poll. We would like to see uh, uh, what experience uh, uh, you show up. And I think the figures are impressive. More than one third of our uh, participants today are newcomers. Let me assure you, we will give you insights. We will tell you where you can acquire further information and how to go ahead. So this event is about helping you making success and giving you some hints and tips. It is also very good to see that we have frequent participants and there is a massive base in uh, term of recurrence and with several occasions uh, of participation. This is very important because uh, experience is our best capital in program implementation. Thank you for this. I wrap up the first session. Now it is the time for make a break. Uh, we will come back. Stay tuned. We continue.
Welcome back, fellows. As I promised, now we go into the deepest part of program implementation and highlight to you the success factors of project management under Horizon Europe. Uh, we will address seven topics in the course of the day. Don't forget to ask questions via Slido. We brought you seven experts, seven colleagues uh, who are experts in the field, and there is certainly one common in them, the commitment and devotion uh, to support you and help you making your project a success. And this is the occasion that uh, I'm pleased to uh, uh, invite and welcome here and introduce our first speaker, Ms. Amelie Tristan. Uh, Amelie is deputy head of unit in unit B for uh, agri-food promotion, environmental observation, and innovative governance. Welcome, Amelie. Amelie is uh, uh, long known for me. We started to work uh, in the Commission Research Department some 15 years ago. Amelie has uh, experience on legal and financial matters, and today will help you walking through and highlight the key elements of the grant uh, uh, agreement and uh, some uh, relevant aspects. Amelie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Attila. Good morning to everyone and welcome to our, I should say, your coordinators day. Uh, this is an important event uh, for us um, to pass uh, key messages to you and hopefully help you uh, manage your, your project in a, in a smooth and efficient manner. Because I must say that uh, with your projects, we all have the same goal, uh, drive, it, drive your project into um, success. So today I will be focusing indeed on the uh, legal and financial aspects of uh, grant management. But of course, my session cannot replace uh, the existing documentation and guidance available on the participant portal, the tender uh, 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 and opportunities uh, uh, portal, sorry. Um, so, as I said, I will be focusing on the, the main uh, financial and legal aspects. I will uh, start by reminding you about the roles and responsibilities of the different participants in the project and the obligation related to uh, those roles. I will also maybe uh, clarify or present to you the different communication tools at your disposal uh, and I will insist on the, the importance of uh, keeping in touch with your project officer. And since your project, uh, you may face uh, changes uh, during the project, this is a living process, I will also uh, mention some uh, aspects of these uh, changes and how to handle those uh, changes or other type of deviations during the project. And last but not least, to avoid surprises um, uh, during project implementation and after project implementation, I will also tell you about the documents you should keep um, in case of uh, further controls by the Commission services or other EU bodies. Well, when talking about roles and responsibilities, you may have uh, indeed in your projects different type of uh, participants with different roles. Please keep in mind that uh, under each role, uh, there is a set of conditions with legal rights and obligations. So it's important to know exactly uh, the roles of your participants and to, to identify them uh, properly. So to start uh, with, we, we know that uh, the coordinator is uh, a key uh, player um, in the project, but the coordinator is also as a beneficiary as the other ones. The, the only thing is that they have additional uh, responsibilities, mainly monitoring the proper implementation of the project, but also reporting uh, on the project acti activities. The coordinator is also um, the intermediary, the only intermediary with uh, the Commission services, the agency, in our case, the research executive agency. And of course, uh, the coordinator is responsible for administering uh, the EU funding. But we do expect also that the coordinator is supported by a team, and this is written on this uh, slide, uh, that it means for us that uh, we, you, you should count and rely on uh, experts uh, for the project implementation, financial experts, that you should not be alone. This is, um, this is important. You should also uh, plan uh, for business continuity solutions. So we recommend strongly to have backup coordinators during uh, the, the implementation of the project. Then talking about beneficiaries and affiliated entities, those beneficiaries, the beneficiaries, they do implement uh, action tasks and they receive funding for that because they are eligible for funding and they are 
individually liable for the funding they receive. This is an important element. And beneficiary is also responsible for the funding received by their affiliated uh, entities. When talking about project implementation, technical responsibilities, here we talk about a collective joint technical responsibility at the level of the consortium. What does that mean? It means that in case um, something goes wrong, that uh, you need to, to replace uh, the, a, a participant, the whole consortium is responsible to find a solution for the continuation of the project. Then other participants may implement uh, the action. This is the case of associated partners. Those participants, they are not signing the grant agreement. They do not receive EU funding, but they still have obligations under the grant agreement and essentially for the proper implementation of the project. So it's very important that you define very well and properly the, the role and responsibilities of the associated partners in your consortium agreement. And let me mention other type of participants involved in your projects for which we receive a lot of questions for clarification because it's not always clear um, how to, to, to identify those uh, participants. Let's start with subcontractors. Subcontractors, um, they are implementing also the actions, but let's be clear, subcontracting activities are usually limited for your projects because we do expect that all beneficiaries have the capacity and resources to implement the action. Subcontractors, they are also under the responsibilities of the beneficiaries. And since they are working for a price, we expect here that uh, the best value for money or the lowest price is, um, is ensured. Of course, there is no subcontracting between beneficiaries, but it is very important to keep in mind that subcontractors, they do implement part of the action and their activities are clearly defined in the description of the action. If you have other type of um, contribution from third parties, be it um, outsourcing of activities um, or even in-kind contribution from uh, other subparties, be it uh, for free or against payment, this will not be considered um, as subcontractors, but most probably as purchase of cost or in-kind contribution. And for you to make the distinction, always keep in mind this concept of implementing the action or contributing to a task. If it's not per se an implementation of a task, then it will fall under this category of other third parties. In case of doubt, of course, I would just recommend you to contact your project officer to clarify. And this is an essential aspect that I would like to emphasize here, that you really need to stay in touch with your project officer. Your project officer is not alone on our side. Is he or she is um, uh, assisted by also experts on our side, legal advisors, financial experts, and they are there to, to guide you through your project and to provide you with all answers to the questions you may have. This is important that you, you, you really keep in touch with them. You may reach your project officer through the portal messaging facility, I will explain this ground management system, but you can also simply reach them by email or even by phone. They are there to answer your questions and really to support you in the project implementation. Now let me clarify the different tools at your disposal for handling uh, these, uh, these uh, project information or for your grant uh, um, management. You have the participant register. And as it is named, this is at participant level. This is um, uh, the register for all participants, not only in our uh, program, but in many other EU programs. And this register is the dedicated uh, platform for the participants to update information on their organization, let's say legal information. And this is an obligation for all participants to update regularly when necessary information related to their project. But keep in mind that whenever you are with a register, participant register, you are not interacting with your project officer, but with validation services. So in case you encounter issues in that respect, because it might have an impact with your, to, on your project, here again, contact your project officer, because then we will be able to liaise with the dedicated services dealing with the, the participant register. Now we also have the grant management system. And this platform, is used only by the coordinator 
This is the dedicated platform for the coordinators to communicate on their project for general communication purposes, but also, and above all, for the reporting aspects, whenever you will have to report on the implementation of your project, that will be explained later on by my colleagues. But also whenever you have to report on any potential change, amendments needed for your project. I will uh, come in more details on the amendments later on, but just I would like to mention the last um, communication channel, which is the formal notification, which is rarely used, but still it's there for all participants, and we use it essentially whenever we need to have acknowledgement of receipt of our communication. And I mentioned that you may have some changes during the implementation of your project. Indeed, you may have changes in your consortium, changes uh, in your budget, changes in your activities. Don't forget that, or keep in mind that any major change to the grant agreement should be done through an amendment well, it might be a bit difficult to assess what is a major change. And in that case, again, I invite you always to contact your project officer in case you, you are facing such change, any type of change, I would say. And then, of course, you should keep in mind that major could be, a major change could be change of, uh, change of coordinator for sure, but change of participants, or changes in your project which may alter the overall objectives of your project or your work plan. Only coordinator can launch and submit amendments through the dedicated platform I just mentioned. But you should also know that under Horizon Europe, there is flexibility regarding uh, small changes, budget transfers between participants, or some changes related to uh, the status of uh, organizations, their legal address. This does, doesn't need an amendment. Similarly, we also have simplified approval procedure. What does that mean? It means that whenever you have a deviation in your project implementation, some costs that you've not planned and that you, you will have to incur during the implementation of the project, provided you describe them, justify them properly at reporting stage later on, so without an amendment, it might be approved at the time of the reporting. But here I would like to be clear also that better to discuss it in advance with your project officer to avoid by surprises because this simplified approval procedure is at the discretion of the granting authority. So sometimes you may not anticipate other consequences related to deviations and it's better to discuss it before with your project officer. And on my, I would like to have a few last words uh, again, to avoid uh, bad surprises after the implementation of the project. And this slide is related to keeping records, uh, audits and checks, and also reviews. So for you to know what you need to keep as documentation during the project implementation, but also after. Keep in mind that all participants must keep records uh, and other supporting documents to prove the proper implementation of the project. And this should be done for five years after the payment of the balance, which, is, which means the final payment for the action. You may be asked to provide those documents in the context of reviews, which can be launched during the implementation of the project, but also uh, within two years, up to two years after the final payment, or in the context of financial audits which can also be um, uh, launched during the lifetime of the project based on the cost declared by the beneficiaries and up to two years after the final payment. Just keep in mind that in case of serious and systematic findings uh, related to financial audits, the, 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 the agency may extend the findings, uh, on, on the findings of this uh, particular audit to non-audited grant agreements. So, you, you have now all the elements uh, uh, in hands uh, to, to, to keep your project uh, and the documents uh, complete for potential uh, controls uh, by the Commission or other EU bodies. And this is the end of my session. Uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, I wish you all the success for your project. Thank you.
Thank you, Amelie, indeed, for this substantial uh, presentation. Uh, stay with us. Uh, we will devote some time for the questions uh, at the end of this panel. And now we immediately move on. Colleagues, ethics is always in the focus of research. Uh, the same stands true for Horizon Europe. Therefore, uh, I brought an expert uh, today who will uh, introduce you and uh, some key aspects and uh, give some advice. I have to, the pleasure to welcome here Francisca Cuesta Sanchez. Francisca is co-coordinator in our department. Uh, uh, she has uh, uh, more than eight years experience now in REA in uh, call uh, management and uh, ethical aspects. Besides this, uh, Francisca holds a PhD in uh, pharmaceutical science uh, and uh, has more than 15 years underlying experience in clinical research. Uh, after this brief introduction, I have the pleasure to give you the floor. Francesca, please. Thank you very much, Attila. So I'm going to uh, give you an overview about the ethical aspects of the, of the projects. Okay, so ethics and research integrity are key in Horizon Europe, as pointed out in the Horizon Europe Regulation 2021-695 and in Article 14 and Annex 5 of the Grand Agreement. So the members of the consortium need to implement the action in compliance with the ethical aspects and with the highest standards of research integrity and in compliance with the EU international and national law. So before you start any activity, you need to ensure you have all the authorizations required in, uh, uh, in, your, in your organization to perform these activities. Also, in the Horizon Europe regulation and in the Grand Agreement, you will find a number of activities that are not uh, allowed and therefore are not funded. For example, activities aiming to do uh, human cloning uh, with uh, reproduction purposes or also activities to create embryos with only the purpose of, um, of, uh, of research. Also, an activity performed in a country is not funded if it is not allowed in that country, of course. And also, if you are performing activities outside of the EU, you must ensure that they are allowed in at least one country of the EU. In addition, all the research must be focused on civil applications. This is an overview of the ethics appraisal uh, process during the project life uh, cycle. We start before you submit your proposal. So at the time you prepare your proposal, you had to complete in part A the self-assessment where you had to identify the ethics issues in your proposal and to explain how you were going to comply with the applicable uh, EU international and national regulations. Then after the submission and before the grant agreement uh, preparation, all the proposals in the main and reserve list undergo an ethics screening. That means each proposal is reviewed by two ethics experts. The first thing they need to do is to determine if the proposal involves serious or complex ethics issues. If this is the case, then a deeper analysis is required and those proposals are sent to assessment. And, they are, and those proposals are checked by a panel of four or five experts. So those proposals that do not raise complex or serious issues, they stay at the screening step and then you will get a screening uh, ethics summary report. What are the ethics uh, experts indicating? They are going to identify the ethics issues and they may put one requirement related to an ethics uh, advisor or board, or they may request or recommend additional monitoring. So what is important is that you go to, uh, to the portal, you open the ethics summary report, and you check what are the ethics issues that have been identified by the experts, so you are ensured that you have addressed all of them, or you are addressing all of them, you also have to see if they have required the appointment of an ethics advisor or board. If this is the case, you are going to see several deliverables in your grant agreement. You are going to see one deliverable for the appointment of the independent external ethics advisor or board, and you will see an individual deliverable for each report that this ethics advisor or board has to prepare. Normally, 
the report are due at the end of each reporting period, but it may vary from project to project. At the same time, it's possible that they don't require an, uh, an ethics advisor, but they recommend that you have an ethics mentor. Okay? The ethics mentor can be somebody of the consortium or working an employee of one of the beneficiaries, and there are no reporting obligations. However, it is recommended that you keep a report of the activities performed by this ethics mentor. In addition, the ethics expert may require that we perform an ethics check or an ethics review during the implementation of the project. So what is the difference? An ethics check is something a bit lighter and is performed at the level of the operational level. So will be done with the project officer, supported by the ethics representative, and we may contract one or two ethics experts. An ethics review is a deeper analysis that is performed by the ethics team of RTD, and it, it is done with a panel of five experts. So this is something that you can see. However, even if that is not recommended by the ethics expert, the PO may decide to send a proposal uh, or a project uh, to, uh, to perform an ethics check or an ethics review during the project implementation. Uh, then during the project execution, then uh, we are doing ethics checks and reviews. You need to submit uh, the deliverables uh, related to the, to the advisor. Uh, and this is only, of course, for the projects that have a grant agreement. For those projects undergoing assessment, you may have requirements. You may have a requirement about each of the ethics issues identified by the experts. So there you will see the difference, but the message is open the report and read what are the requirements for your, um, for your project. Even at the end of the project, two years after the payment of the balance, we can still perform uh, ethics audits. Uh, however, it has to be clear that not because your report shows clear, that means you are exempted to comply with the EU national or international regulations. Okay? It means the ethics experts believe that you are well aware of the ethics issues and you know how to comply with the regulations. For this reason, in every grant agreement, in every report, you have a general requirement that is reminding you that you have to comply with all the applicable regulations and also a link to the guide how to complete your ethics self-assessment, which uh, you have probably used at the time of the submission of the proposal, but should be your guide throughout the complete project implementation. So this is uh, what I wanted to discuss with you, and I give back to Attila for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca, for this substantial, uh, concentrated and dense presentation about uh, ethics. Uh, colleagues, as announced, now it is time for reviewing some Slido questions. Uh, before I read out the first uh, question aloud, uh, I remind you that you can uh, submit questions and equally, when you see a relevant question already submitted, you can use the upvote button and uh, in this way, uh, you can give a push to certain questions, those that we will uh, feature. Now, I am looking at the questions. Uh, uh, the first and most upvoted, does REA has a list of professionals for the role of external independent ethics advisors that can be contacted by the beneficiaries? Francisca, I think this is very much for you. So we have a list of the experts that we can contract as our ethics advisors. However, we cannot uh, give that list or share that list with the beneficiaries. So our recommendation is always is that you contact your ethics uh, uh, board or your ethics uh, committee or the, uh, the person or in the case of data protection, your DPO, so your data protection officer to give you advice of uh, independent experts in the subjects uh, of your, I mean, related to or uh, with expertise in the ethics issues identified for your project. Indeed. So the list we are using, the, the base, expert base, is not uh, for disclosure. Uh, I think this is the moment that we can point back to the introduction. Use your network, uh, and this way you can acquire appropriate experts. 
The next question reads as follows. Uh, civil servants that are paid by the government, are the personal costs of civil servants declared as personal costs or as in-kind contributions? Uh, Amelie, this is very much for you, please. Yeah, thank you, Attila. Uh, well, the principle is that uh, any personal costs on the payroll of a beneficiary uh, can be declared as an eligible personal cost for the project, provided that the person is working on the project, of course. Now, talking about this specific question on in-kind contribution, maybe you may have uh, people uh, seconded uh, and, and paid by the government, so not directly on your payroll as the beneficiary, and in that case, they will be considered as uh, in-kind contribution from third party, be it against payment or for free, but this is to be considered as in-kind contribution to be declared um, in, your, in your cost statement. Thank you. Cost category depends on the circumstances. Uh, let me put here a parenthesis uh, regarding all questions and the answers we give. We will record them, uh, transpose it into a written FAQ and feature in our events web page. So information is not lost. Uh, you will have an overview that you can browse and even uh, reuse it uh, after this event. Moving to the third question. Is a paid or a pro bono activity the one implemented by the external independent ethics advisors? So, uh, of course, the independent ethics advisor, it is nobody, it's, a, it's not an employee of any, uh, of none of the beneficiaries or affiliated entities, because it has to be external and independent. And this person or this board is providing a service. So it has to be tra treated as any other service provider. So you will need to contract according to their expertise, best value for money, absence of conflict of interest, provide a contract and pay it according to, to, the, to the market uh, value, of course. So they are providing a service as any other service provider. Francisca, if I understand well, here it is very important uh, to safeguard the fact that the expert acting independently. Yes. So it's, it's, it's less a bookkeeping uh, uh, issue at first, but more the fact that uh, those uh, ethics advisors need to act in independence. Uh. Independent also and, uh, and knowledgeable. When you select your expert, you need to make sure that it's an expert on the ethics issues relevant to your proposal. Because if you have animal uh, research, then you need to have somebody with experience in animal research. If you have uh, data protection, and you need somebody with expertise in data protection. So the expertise, independency, and, uh, and uh, also the, the, I mean, and that there is no conflict of interest. Thank you. Uh, here we emphasize, uh, and I point back to the previous question, uh, whether we have a database and why we don't disclose this database and make it public. The reason behind this, uh, uh, as simple as this Francisca explained, uh, we don't want to propose or hint for experts. Uh, here is very important that, that you acquire those uh, uh, expertise uh, in an independent and uh, uh, separate manner. Now, moving to the next question, because we have still uh, sufficient time in this panel to answer questions live. Here we go. Could you explain in more details when do we need to use in-kind contributions if there is a payment to the supplier? Use of, for example, use of uh, laboratory facilities in an, uh, in an other entity uh, other than the beneficiary. Amelie? Yes. So when do you need to use uh, in-kind contribution? I mean, you do not uh, necessarily need to use uh, in-kind contribution. It might happen uh, in your project. And uh, here the example is on the uh, use of uh, lab facilities. So you may have a third party uh, providing access to lab facilities for your project, lab facilities that you don't have. And in that case, uh, you, okay, depending if it's against payment or in-kind contribution again, but both are eligible uh, under Horizon Europe, uh, then you will, uh, you will uh, use this uh, facility and declare the cost uh, under, the, under your, your cost statement, under the beneficiary's cost statement. Shall I uh, further explain? Um, Maybe we, if we elaborate in a way that actually our rules allow uh, both so that you can set to your own circumstances. For instance, in kind is very much typical when there is a, a long lasting relationship that uh, dates back uh, way before the start of the project. They have an arrangement and 
in kind may be typical. If this is a fresh relationship or the activity why you are hiring a, a lab is for the purpose of the project, in this case, uh, against payment. If I may just add, uh, Attila, that of course uh, you, you always need to establish whether uh, here it's just the purpose of uh, using uh, the lab, but if the third party is uh, implementing a, a task, uh, then better to consider it as a, as a participant, as a, sorry, as a beneficiary, if it's an implementation of a task under the project, or a subcontractor. So don't forget this uh, concept of implementing fully a task or contributing to the implementation of a task. Thank you, Emily. Uh, again, showing my tendency to, to say uh, bracketed information, uh, if the answers to these questions uh, make you think that something is wrong in the grant agreement, in the technical description, as just you, you got, uh, because we should not hide that uh, most of the projects uh, uh, behind the first wave of funded project are just about to start. So don't be worried uh, if you would like to rectify uh, the situation. As Amelie said, we can uh, do those uh, and enforce the changes via amendments. So don't be worried. After this uh, event, you can go back, discuss the matter with your project advisor, and we can uh, rectify the situation if need be. Moving to the next question that is, uh, as I read, uh, related to the Modern Grant Agreement. The Modern Grant Agreement says the audit can take place up to five years after the end of the project. Yes, this is true. This presentation from Alice said only about uh, two years. Uh, can you please clarify the difference? There is a difference, Amelie. Yes, there is a difference, uh, and I was just double checking my slide actually <laughs> to make sure that there is no no error. So, uh, so first of all, I mean, end of the action doesn't mean uh, end of your grant agreement, so that's uh, quite important. And uh, you, 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 we, sorry, uh, the agency or the commission services may launch reviews or audit uh, uh, within a period up to two years after the final payment and you need to keep the documentation for a period of five years. So this is, this is the, the, the message so, and the difference. Very important. Again, an anecdote, uh, colleagues. Um, when we talk about the model grant agreement, those who have a long track record in participating R&I framework programs funded by EU uh, know that uh, we always had a particular model grant agreement. Now, something substantial changed uh, since last year. Uh, what we use as the model grant agreement is uh, something that is applicable in its core parts to all EU direct funded programs. Here we talk about something like 50 different direct funded programs, way, way beyond uh, research and innovation. Wherever you participate, your, your company, your uh, entity is participating, you may say exactly the same rules. Let me echo what uh, Amelie clearly said. Record keeping obligation is for five years. Audits, ex post audits may be launched after and within two years after the end date of the project. So that's the difference between the two and the five. And uh, we move to the next question. Uh, we had not planned a budget to pay for this independent ethical service, uh, I presume, but there is an obligation arising. Do we have to reduce our actions to pay for it? I mean, the cost of an independent advice can be maybe one, a couple of thousand euros. So if we have projects of five, 10 million, 11 million, like 5,000 euros will have a very minor impact on, on, on the budget of your project. So the message is just make sure you have, uh, you find the best value for money. So it's really a very minor cost. Certainly the costs should be proportional. Uh, another advice that may work in this case that uh, you can look at your uh, costing and may you may relocate some funds, some resources from other activities. Uh, ethics uh, enjoys priority. For keeping financial records, and I read the next question uh, that's moved up, uh, apparently the, the voting changes the order of the question. So here we go. Do we need to report uh, if one partner changes the contract they had planned from PhD to postdoctoral? I presume this is the, the grade of the behind the personal cost. Reducing person months without changing the total funded amount. Uh, 
complex question, but I think the answer may be straight uh, owing to the experience of Amelie, please. <laughs> So you need to report on the uh, implementation of the action. If, uh, if there is no deviation compared to the initial budget, uh, in terms of overall, bud overall uh, budget, uh, this will not be identified as a deviation. But uh, if suddenly you replace uh, all your staff working on the project uh, from uh, senior researchers by uh, junior researchers, then it might be an impact. Uh, on, on, on not only uh, the overall budget, but also um, on the uh, quality of the work delivered. So I would say that uh, you, you, you will report on, on what is uh, the, the most uh, deviating from the initial plan. Indeed. The important is that you do report it, and not only in the next due report, but since this may imply a substantial change, uh, definitely, we strongly recommend uh, contacting uh, your uh, fellow project advisor in the agency and inform about these changes. Uh, maybe uh, you can even obtain a advice on how to best uh, go ahead with these changes. Financial records keeping concern the next question. What resource explains specifically the documents and records all beneficiaries and coordinators should keep? Amelie? I'm thinking, uh, I'm not sure that uh, we do have such resource uh, with detailed information uh, for Horizon Europe. I recall a um, um, similar document under the previous program, so I'm sure that the Commission will provide the same uh, uh, type of uh, information, which was um, uh, documents uh, to explain what the auditors actually verify uh, whenever they, um, they, they run a financial audit. So for this, I suggest that uh, maybe we, we go back to our um, colleagues uh, to see if there will be uh, such a resource uh, available. Um, because I'm not sure that uh, currently uh, uh, more than the annotated grant agreement is uh, at the disposal of beneficiaries. And I know that for the annotated uh, grant agreement that there are still sections to be uh, developed by uh, the Commission. Indeed, uh, for further legal la reference, we will contact the competent service uh, to establish such a list. In the other hand, uh, as always, common sense applies. It is more than rare that we, when I say we, the auditors would ever ask more documents that otherwise you usually have to keep on records in your member state, in your country of origin, for the purpose of uh, local tax or any authority checks and controls. We are not going beyond that. Uh, uh, furthermore, I add there is an overall and very bold uh, intention from our side that we don't want to create additional burden beyond that your normal operation uh, would require in your uh, established uh, uh, country of origin. I think we still have time for some questions. I am looking uh, to the next one. 1st of October is official start date of the project. Kickoff is the 4th and 5th of October. To book day are asking for prepayment. Uh, can we pay them before the official start date? I mean, this is eligibility of costs and the eligibility date of costs that is the question about. Yes, usually uh, costs are eligible uh, during the time uh, frame of your project, so first start date and end date. Um, regarding a, a, a prepayment or pay in cost incurred for activities uh, uh, within uh, the duration of the, your project. This is uh, normally uh, possible that uh, if you have an event um, which will occur during, so after the start date of the project, but that you, you, you book and pay before, uh, this is still uh, eligible. And um, this is the same for uh, activities, I mean meetings, uh, for the final meeting after the end, um, uh, at the end of the project, you need to have project activities within the time frame of your project. But then you have an exception for the reporting costs that you may have after the end date of the project because you still have the 60 days to report uh, on your activities and those are uh, exceptions um, uh, with eligibility of those costs uh, for reporting. 
So what is important is uh, uh, when the cost is incurred, of course, but for, an, uh, for, for what purpose and for an activity which is related to the project. Indeed, here the right word that we emphasize is the activity. It is completely normal that uh, you make your travel ar arrangements now or even in the middle of the summer, even if uh, you have this meeting on the 4th of October and you have had to pay for this uh, over the summer, these costs are eligible because the activity, the very meeting in question or whatever else is, is after the date, of the st after the start date of the project. That's counts. Uh, very clear. Thank you, Emily. Still, one more question. A municipality in which civil servants work, and that is a beneficiary, are the personal costs of these civil servants personal costs or in-kind contribution to the project? Amelie? I think it's similar to the question we just had uh, uh, at the beginning of the session. So uh, if you are in the municipality is a beneficiary, the personal cost, I mean, the people working on the, uh, the, the responsibility of that beneficiary, if they are directly uh, uh, um, employed by the municipality, these are to be considered personal cost. Very clear direct personal costs if these are the contributions of a personal directory hired and employed by the beneficiary. Next question, how much in person can be shifted under a budget flexibility before an amendment is necessary? Uh, well, uh, it very much depends on the cost category, Amelie, isn't it? Yes, it's not really a percentage. This is because uh, we not only have a budget just for the purpose of having figures, your budget is uh, linked to um, uh, activities, efforts, work packages. So when you shift activities between beneficiaries, uh, keeping uh, the, the same, uh, the same uh, level of work, uh, this is not a big issue, but be careful because for certain uh, uh, type of actions such as uh, innovation action, you may have a change of budget uh, overall of funding if you transfer from one not-profit uh, 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 organization receiving 100% of the funding to a private entity uh, not receiving 100%, uh, 70%. So it might have an impact, and in that case, you will have to discuss because uh, you may have a reduction of your EU funding. Then, uh, when talking about budget categories, of course, if you suddenly uh, uh, subcontract everything which was supposed to be done, this is a substantial change also. Um, uh, so uh, this should be uh, discussed and, and and because uh, it might be that uh, even an amendment will not be accepted in that case. So it's, it's more about the activities uh, that uh, you, you plan to reshuffle, uh, but also uh, in terms of volume of, uh, of uh, budget, there is no percentage as such, but whenever you need to reshuffle uh, activities, better to discuss it in advance with your uh, project officer. I would like also to mention that um, uh, the, it's not that you can also uh, uh, create a new category. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you cannot uh, um, uh, envisage suddenly uh, financial support to third parties uh, if it's not foreseen uh, for the, 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 the topic uh, your, your, your project um, is funded uh, under the, 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 the topic. So there are minimum uh, conditions which are defined at the level of the core uh, that you cannot uh, change during the implementation of the project. I think the golden rule we add to this uh, framing explanation, whenever you see a change coming, change is necessary, inform the project advisor in charge, uh, you will certainly get a clear answer what is the impact, maybe impact that you are missing and what needs to be done. Uh, I always uh, say it, go and inform in advance. Uh, informing ex post means only reporting may be late, sometimes even too late. Next question. Can you please provide some more information about how affiliated entities are associated with the core entity? Do they submit their own financial reports? Very imminent question. Amelie, you are the number one answering questions today. Yes, so affiliated entities, there are conditions to be uh, considered as an affiliated entity. So first of all, you need to have a legal or a capital link with uh, the beneficiary. This is, uh, this is a prerequisite. You cannot just bring uh, any uh, entity as an affiliated entity. Uh, then affiliated entities, uh, when we, we, 
include them in a project, it's because they do implement part of the action again. So it's not otherwise if this is just a contribution to an action, then it can be also in kind contribution uh, against payment. And yes, uh, affiliated entities, even though they do not sign the grant agreement, they are under the responsibility of, um, of the uh, beneficiary. They do declare their eligible cost. They do submit financial statements. Um, and they do uh, receive part uh, of the funding uh, through uh, their um, affiliates. Thank you, Evmeli. I think we still have time for some questions. Mm -hmm. I move to the next one. Uh, can you please, again, moving uh, now, it is an upvoted one, okay? Uh, it uh, relates to personal costs. Uh, uh, for personal costs, we will use daily rate. Will the financial reporting include person months reporting or days? Emily? Yes. Uh, you report uh, on days, if I'm not wrong. Uh, daily rate. Uh, they are not recording the same day. And um, for these, I think uh, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, important to refer to the, the, um, the details on how you calculate uh, uh, the, the daily rate. Uh, for the reporting purposes. I know that uh, there are many questions also to get um, uh, more information on how to report your cost, and especially uh, personal cost. Um, for this, I think we should also uh, uh, provide in the, in the FAQ uh, uh, references also to the uh, general sessions provided by the Commission on the, 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 the financial aspects, because you have there uh, all the, the details. So. Thank you, Amelie. Uh, this question and the imminent answer makes me uh, uh, think whether I can only uh, announce, in particular since we saw that one third of our participants are newcomers. So, uh, dear fellows, uh, today you are watching a specialty session that is related to cluster six. However, we keep the corporate leverage and I'm proud to announce that on the 4th of October there will be a generic coordinator day on Horizon Europe where our fellow colleagues from the Common Implementation Center will address horizontal aspects and give you technical details. These details address two main uh, areas. One is amendments and the practicals how to do it. So it's very much uh, hands-on. And also the second will relate to reporting, in particular the reporting on financial matters and calculating personal costs. So I already uh, strongly suggest to everyone, because the program is new, but in particular for newcomers to join this uh, uh, event on the 4th of October, we will send to all of our registered uh, uh, participants today the link uh, uh, to this event. The event will be similarly uh, uh, virtual like ours today. And I take now the last two questions. Can the coordinator see or modify the researchers' information of other partners in uh, the system? It may be handy if a partner misses info that may block the submission of the periodic reporting. Amelie, all questions go to you today. I'm not sure I got the answer, um, but maybe, like, do you know at GAP stage whether the coordinator can modify this section? They can enter the ones of the affiliated entities, for example, they can enter because the affiliated, not the affiliated, the associated partners, because the associated partners don't have access. So uh, they have, uh, they, can, they can modify. I'm not sure if they can modify of the other beneficiaries, but of the associated partners, yes. Uh, if I may compliment, there is a baseline rule in our IT system. Uh, data is uh, split into two. There is the proprietary data that belongs to a given beneficiary, and there is the common data that belongs to the project. The common data is mainly be editable by the coordinating entity. However, proprietary data, and well might be the case that the researcher profile is typically like this, is only be editable by the beneficiary, and the given beneficiary can make changes uh, on behalf of the linked uh, uh, associated uh, partner of the given beneficiary. So this is the division or in terms of who can edit what in the system. And now I think that's the right moment to close with an ethics question. Ethics advisor services are paid by the other goods and services budget, if I understand. So is the question. How should the ethics advisor fit into the management structure? 
I'm not sure uh, what you mean by fitting into the management structure. This is a service provider that provides a service. So you don't integrate the advisor in your management uh, structure. They will have access to the documents. They will be invited to meetings, but they are not part of the consortium. They are just an external independent service provider. Indeed, uh, when we talk about the project, uh, they don't need to be part of the organic uh, uh, management structure or the organization of the project. Uh, quite the contrary, since ethics is something uh, transversal, that might be the case that in your organization, uh, you have already an ethics supervisory board, but that's another story. When we talk about the project, there is no explicit need to integrate ethics advisors into the uh, management team of the project. Briefly, this is the advisor um, regarding uh, the first part of the question. Uh, can we confirm that this is the right approach? That uh, since it is acquired as a service. Yeah, this is purchase course now. That's, that other goods and services was in Horizon 2020. Now it's a purchase course because it's a supporting. It's not really a research. It's a supporting activity that what they do. Even if there is a deliverable, they are supporting. They are not implementing an action task. Thank you. Uh, we can take the last question if uh, we still have one. Uh, I'm looking at my colleagues. Uh, apparently, this is the last uh, uh, most upvoted question. So that makes me conclude on uh, this panel. Ladies, it was a pleasure. I think this was more than fruitful and shows how uh, rich and enriching the discussion may be about uh, the various informations. Uh, we make here a little bake. Thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, don't go uh, further away. We make now a small, let's say, three minutes technical break and we uh, come back soon. In the meantime, stay tuned and uh, you can still elaborate questions. We keep an eye on it. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back, fellows. We move on. This is the third panel in this coordinator's days. I have two distinct gentlemen with me, and we will address uh, uh, two delicate topics. One is actually the reporting and implementation of the project. And in the second uh, presentation, you will hear about uh, matters of the intellectual property rights, or IPR, as we say. And I already move on and introduce uh, uh, my fellow colleague, George uh, Predonio. Uh, George is uh, uh, holding a PhD and has 25 years of experience in uh, uh, nature research, uh, management of biodiversity. And what I like most that uh, George likes nature and enjoys being out in the mountains, being in the Alps or the uh, mighty Carpathian mountains. Welcome, George. The floor is yours. Thank you, Attila. We will discuss today about two important aspects in uh, your life as a coordinator of uh, Horizon Europe project. It's about project implementation best practices and about reporting to EU. In terms of project implementation, we would like to share with you some best practices about uh, the way to collaborate with us and uh, how to collaborate also with the uh, external actors. It is very important to inform and discuss with REA project officer about the implementation issues and to do not wait until the last minute to inform us because we are also a link to with the EC policy officers and we collaborate uh, closely with them also. Sometimes it's not uh, possible to take retroactive actions on your grant, so that's why timely informing us is very important. Then another important thing is to request regular updates as coordinator from your consortium in order to avoid the surprises in terms of implementation aspect. We would suggest to, for a reporting period of 18 months to request regular updates in months 6, 12 and 18. Uh, in terms of uh, communication dissemination, and uh, sharing experiences with other uh, uh, organizations. It's important to establish links and collaborations with projects and initiatives at all levels and to act as an ambassador for EU research and innovation, to demonstrate to the uh, citizens and to the society, but also to research organizations that uh, uh, the research funded by you has an uh, important impact also on them. Uh, also, it's important to value your project results and to identify the key exploitable results and outputs in order to achieve the expected impacts from the topic, from the work program, and to create synergies with stakeholders. A novelty in Horizon Europe uh, project implementation are also the aspects related to gender equality. This will be checked at the end of each reporting period by us, and that therefore it's important to understand that the gender equality can be found in gender balance in decision-making processes, can be found in gender balance and equal opportunities in teams at all levels, and can be also found in gender dimension in research and innovation content. Uh, in terms of uh, project implementation, again, we have to uh, take into account the EU green priorities. In terms of sustainable project management, in terms of travel and meetings, and in terms of communication and dissemination. It, in terms of uh, project management, uh, please try to promote and agree measures to minimize the impact of your activities uh, on the environment. Also, exchange be best practices with other organizations and other projects. Uh, when you travel, assess the need of travel and try to use the sustainable means of transport and limit the number of participants of travelers. Promote hybrid meetings and events whenever it's possible. In some situation, it's more useful to have direct meetings. In communication and dissemination, promote online meetings and mi minimize the use of printed information materials. Uh, now, on the second part of this presentation, we will talk about reporting to EU. Uh, which are the reporting documents, what is important uh, in, in, in terms of these reporting documents and what how we're going to do the assessment of your project. The deliverables are uh, very important reporting documents to EU. They are written, they must be written as self-explanatory documents because they are read by external people. They are read by people which are not deeply involved in your project and uh, they need to understand what you have done and what results you have obtained. Also, the deliverables with dissemination level public, they are available for public in the EU portal. 
They must have clear messages, conclusions based on prior stakeholder consultation, and to be in an attractive format using infographics and diagrams. Uh, another type of document are the periodic report. This is a template document. And because it's a template document, there is already an information which is requested in the periodic report. Please do not overload the information there with information from deliverables, which is not specifically requested. This information can be also presented in the annexes of the periodic report. This periodic report should include the changes and deviations from the grant agreement and the measures you take to solve these problems. We, we have to understand together which were the problems and how you overcome them. You should also provide details in this periodic report about uh, specific aspects on, on financial statements in order to link, to be able to link the work done with the cost claimed. Uh, in reporting to EU, there are two modules, continuous reporting module and periodic reporting module. The continuous reporting module is open all along the project duration. There you can up upload deliverables, you can introduce information milestones and other information also on publications. Uh, this can be done by you on a regular basis or on an ad hoc basis. The periodic reporting is opening at the end of each reporting period. You have maximum 60 days to report to EU and we have maximum 90 days to do the project assessment and to pay the EU contribution. Uh, in the periodic reporting, you as consortium and as coordinator, you have some tasks. All partners, all beneficiaries must provide information to coordinator. The beneficiaries, they, they sign and submit their financial statements, but also they can insert information in the technical report. The coordinator prepares the entire package for submission. He, the coordinator, he or she can check the data of the financial statements of the beneficiaries and also finalize insert data and finalize the technical report. After this, the report, the package is ready to be signed and submitted by coordinator to REA. After submission of the periodic reports, we do the project review, which is an assessment of the project progress based on Article 25 of the grant agreement. Who is doing this? REA project officer and financial officer, together with external monitors, with project consortium, and we invited the uh, EC colleagues from uh, policy DGs. When we do this, at the end of each reporting period, after submission of your report. What we do? We exchange information and we get feedback from each other in terms of uh, implementation aspects and in terms of policy aspects also. We assess the project's progress based on grant agreement provisions and on information from continuous reporting, deliverables milestones, and from periodic reporting. During this project review, we can have also an online or in situ meeting, a review meeting. We can organize together a policy session with participation of EC policy officers. And several projects in the same thematic area can organize also a, a project clustering session in order to share experience and to present together the results. Uh, the main documents in this process of the project review are the review report, which is done by the monitors, the experts, and is externalized to consortium through EU portal. The consortium has 30 days to reply, to send comments to this review report. If you don't have comments, it's not compulsory to send us an answer through the EU portal. And based on this review report and on other information from reporting, the project officer is doing a PO assessment report. This PO assessment report it includes the acceptance, rejection of the reports and costs, it includes also the recommendations for the future, for the next implementation period. And these recommendations will be externalized to you through the uh, payment letter. The PO assessment report is closing the process of reporting to you and triggers the payment of EU contribution. I would like to thank you very much for attention and I wait for your questions. Thank you, George. Regarding the questions, I suggest that we wait and as now usual, at the end of the, the panel, after the second presentation, we will go live with the questions. 
my message to the colleagues, uh, again, uh, submit your question or check out already submitted questions. And if you find relevant ones, you can use the upload button. And uh, some of the questions uh, you will also be answered already online. Later on, we will feature questions. But now we move on. And I have the pleasure to uh, introduce actually our uh, invited guest today, uh, Mr. Yanis Sagias. Yanis is a long-standing colleague of mine. Uh, he works uh, on valorization policies in the research department of the Commission. And uh, I am very pleased to have him here today because uh, he was one of the pen holders of what we call Horizon 2020 uh, Dissemination and Exploitation Strategy. He also worked uh, uh, on the very same topic for Horizon Europe. And actually, I think it is fair to say, uh, Yanni, that you are one of the uh, um, intellectual parents of what we call the Horizon Europe platform. So the topic, the very topic he brought in uh, is uh, intellectual property rights and management. And the right person is here to tell you because Janet is the person who likes the overall picture and the grant context. Uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Attila. And uh, dear participants, um, I would like to take you through this uh, presentation about uh, IPR management best practices. And I would like to start with the things that you will see as obligations inside the the grant agreement, you will see them uh, also um, uh, written in the calls of the, um, uh, in the calls for proposals. And I would like to close the presentation with some advices and some further um, uh, guidance that, that you can find even online about making the most of your project regarding your results, your exploitable results, and using the best IP strategy. So the first thing we have to see is that uh, you have some obligations, and these are uh, in between the so-called non-financial obligations of the model grant agreement. And you have, you have to use your best efforts to exploit the results you own. The results are, of course, yours. Commission does not have any rights on your results, but you do your best efforts to exploit these results. And you need to know which one of them are exploitable or not. I think it was mentioned before by, 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 George, by George that you need to identify them as early as possible. You need to protect your results, and you need to see if there are any prospects for commercial exploitation and act way in advance, even in the preparation of your proposal and in the forming of your consortium. And of course, if results are not exploited, that's a novelty of Horizon Europe, uh, you need to enhance and, um, and promote the third party exploitation. There might be other legal entities that want to do something with your results. So you apply the right protection, the right licensing, and you use obligatory one year after the end of your project, the Horizon Results Platform, which is made um, to host exploitable results and make them visible to other third parties and also allow you to express your needs for the further step in your exploitation plan. One other novelty that we have inside uh, Horizon Europe and you see in your uh, grant agreements is the results ownership list. Why we, we did that? Because it is important for the Commission to know who owns what at the end of the project. It is important also to know who brings in what in the beginning of the project, but since the consortium agreement is solely in your hands, we need to know for, for reasons of help, support and follow-up who owns the results at the end of the project. So there's a dedicated form in the reporting template, which you need to fill. And I will say that you don't have to uh, fill in the form with, uh, um, let's say, the list of, pu of publications. That's a different part of the, your reporting. But we need to know the exploitable results and who owns them, because we need to be able to help and support. If you don't provide these results on recipe list, then that will have consequences in your final payment. Then. What else you might see is the public emergency provision. So you might see some calls that have called for public emergency provision. What is that? Is the right uh, of, the, of the funding authority, in this case REA, the Commission, to request the beneficiaries to grant non-exclusive licenses under fair and reasonable conditions when we have a genuine and sufficiently serious threat undermining security, public order or public health. And that was actually applied in the case of COVID-19. To whom? To whom you will grant these uh, non-exclusive licenses? 
to legal entities that need the results to address the public emergency as fast as possible and make a broader exploitation of your results. How long? Duration that will be decided by the granting authority and the maximum can be up to four years after the end of the action, after the end of your projects. And of course, it's for all projects, only for the projects that are under the specific call for proposals that instigated the public emergency provision. Another thing that you will see, and it's not a novelty of Horizon Europe, but it's, it's a different way to apply it, is the right to object to exclusive licenses and transfer of ownership of results outside the Union, to third parties outside the Union or to third countries outside the Union. So, again, in the call, you might have specific provisions saying that um, the right to object applies to all projects. And what is this right to object? That the Commission has the right to uh, object to exclusive licensing or ownership of results in cases that we have legal entities established in non-EU countries or non-associated with Horizon Europe or if we have uh, issues that the transfers or the transfer of ownership or the exclusive licenses are against the EU interests. Of course, beneficiaries can notify the Commission about this uh, particular um, uh, clause and ask this uh, right to object to be waived on specific uh, uh, reasons and, and conditions. And of course, that will be examined by the Commission in a case by, by case. So you will not be surprised if you see such clauses um, in, uh, in your modern grant agreement and also in the calls that you're submitting your proposals. And of course, there's the additional exploitation obligation. Here, there's a small mistake, Attila. I would like to correct this Article 39, not Article 34. Small, uh, small mistake there. That calls for additional exploitation obligation. So we have the right as the Commission to ask more uh, exploitation obligations from beneficiaries under specific calls and specific topics. Um, and this can actually um, be either in the sense of, um, let's say, specific results that we would like to see or specific use of the results that we would like to see, specific access to IP or restriction of participation due to strategic assets, interest and autonomy or security reasons of the Union. Of course, this is something that you will not see uh, often, but uh, in case of emergency or, or in case of, of crisis, these things might uh, also appear. Now, I would like to say a couple of things about the guidance on intellectual asset management. And for us, it's not only intellectual property, it's intellectual assets. And everything that you create from your projects is your own asset, is your own intellectual asset. And you really need to think way in advance about how you want to manage these assets, how you want to manage your intellectual assets, how you want to move forward with them or with some of them towards even commercialization or exploitation commercial or even non-commercial exploitation, even in policy making. So I would say just always check what you have defined as exploitable result if this is patented already somewhere else in the world. So please monitor what is happening in the patents outside your project. Consider different IP legislation in different, in different countries. We do have this um, uh, differentiation in IP legislation in the Union. Um, we don't have harmonized IP approach, of course. There are now um, massively moving forward the unitary patent and I advise everybody to use the unitary patent system in order to have uh, a unified patent approach in Europe. However, we still have different IP legislations in member states and associated countries and you need to know how this actually affects you and affects your consortium and your results. Consider involving the necessary skills and profiles in your consortium uh, in order to be able to have the right expertise, let's say have legal IP expertise or have a, a, a company or a, or, a, or a partner or even a subcontractor that can actually help in exploiting and managing the IP that you're generating. And of course, if there are disputes amongst the partners, we expect that all of these are addressed in the consortium agreement. So please pay attention in your consortium agreement. Try to sort out things when it comes to background IP, foreground IP, who owns what, because the Commission has limited uh, competence to help you and intervene in your consortium agreements. Um, of course, what we're trying to do under the valorization policies of the Union, we try to create a code of practice that can help uh, hands -on, with hands-on guidance and hands-on hands um, uh, day-to-day, let's say, help um, on how to manage or how to deal with IP strategies, how to manage your intellectual assets. 
This is co-created with all uh, RNI stakeholders and will be publicly available before the end of 2022. Um, another thing that we would like to mention is that try to have a strategy for your uh, intellectual asset management, intellectual property management throughout the project implementation. Start with, as I said before, start thinking about it at your proposal level and continue with that even throughout the, uh, the project duration, but also after the end of the project, because a lot of exploitation takes place after the end of the project. So this needs to be a core element of your exploitation plan, and it needs to be well reflected, as George said before, in your reporting period. So in your reporting periods, it's not only your technical or scientific deliverables, it should be also your exploitation deliverables and your activities under exploitation and dissemination you are doing. If not already in the consortium, then please consider having partners in industry and society that can help you with further exploitation of your results, commercial or non-commercial, including any transfer of ownership that you might think of. IPR is not only about patents. There are other means of protecting and there are also other available instruments that you can find under the, uh, the EU IPO and the EPO, the European Patent Office and the European Union Intellectual Property Office. And remember that protecting your IP can really help a lot in broadening the access to knowledge and the innovation, for example, by using an open licensing approach. You can find best practices uh, on intellectual asset management in the valorization platform. We have established this platform to showcase best practices coming from member states and stakeholders when you can find ideas on how um, IP is used and managed uh, in other parts of Europe. And you can always watch the video that we have about intellectual asset management for experts evaluators. And I think that this summarizes my presentation. Yanni, thank you very much. Uh, I must say, uh, watching and listening to you, I just realized how substantial is the topic. And uh, I wonder, uh, considering the one third proportion of newcomers in our program and in the recently signed uh, grants, uh, how they can cope with this. Certainly, it is worth repeating, uh, they should go to the valorization platform, uh, take their time and learn. Uh, and maybe we can also say, uh, am I right saying that uh, the best if they acquire uh, con through our, our contract uh, expertise uh, in the uh, respective member state, would you recommend this in particular for smaller uh, entities and those who are really newcomers to uh, research and innovation programs? I would say yes, um, especially for newcomers in our program, it will be nice to have um, all the available knowledge that you can get locally, regionally or nationally through the local uh, IP offices or the, the local, um, let's say, patent libraries. And there is a lot of that help and a lot of that offer in your own language. So please do not hesitate to engage with the local authorities and the local service de delivery. And you can find more of that information in EPO, in EU IPO about IP. Learn about IP and then, if possible, then engage with the right experts and even bring them in your proposals, in your consortiums to help you with the IP management. Thank you, Yanni. I think uh, if I may sum up these two presentations, gentlemen, uh, the leading principle is due diligence, definitely. Whenever it goes for uh, reporting and uh, or simply intellectual property management, uh, the more our fellow beneficiaries prepare and uh, anticipate elements and uh, take out some investment in learning how to do it, uh, then the better uh, expectations they may have for a smooth implementation and a successful implementation one. Time for questions. We have plenty of time. Uh, I uh, look at my colleagues. I would like to see some excellent questions. And here we go. Uh, the inflow, uh, if I may read out uh, aloud. What are the reporting requirements, be it technical, financial, or otherwise, regarding associated partners? This is a very question for you, George. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Otilo. Thank you for the question. So associated partners, they, um, they have te technical requirements for reporting. They have to provide information to the coordinator on the work done and results achieved in order to be included in the periodic report. But they don't have uh, financial requirements for reporting to EU in uh, terms of uh, completing a financial statement. Thank you.
Very clear, thank you. And we move to the next question. How will the EU, as granting authority, verify the involvement of researchers listed in the table of researchers? What record uh, should be kept for providing their involvement? I'm looking at you, George. It's very much your competence. Okay. Good, thank you. So, uh, in terms of uh, research, is also listed in the in the Compass Sigma. So, probably this is the question about the researchers already included in the grant agreement. Um, you can have the, the timesheet for, for the researchers which are uh, working partially in, uh, in the project. And uh, you can have any other documents like participation in the meetings or, uh, or uh, participation in different, uh, in different tasks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If, if I may complement and, and refer back to the principle of due diligence, uh, we don't ask you to, to invent new records, uh, just uh, you have to make sure that you are able to prove. And of course, I would like to point out what we call, uh, as a bold term, research integrity. Uh, your project was selected based on the excellence. In excellence, it always matters uh, who is doing the research. So therefore, we rightfully presume that those whom you involved in the proposal and referred by name, leading researchers uh, uh, based on their profile and competence, they definitely uh, take part in the action and undertake the work. Uh, so if you have changes, we will insist that you report these changes to us and justify. Otherwise, normal, traditional records, as George said, uh, meeting minutes uh, and, and usual records are sufficient. And of course, you need to keep up to date uh, the relevant tables in the IT system. Moving to the next question is also for uh, record keeping. Do we need to keep record of s signed participant lists for project meetings to prove meeting attendance? It's for me also, probably. Uh, yes, indeed, it is important to keep uh, records for the project meetings because uh, we have a budget which is uh, in the grant agreement mentioned and you have meetings there, uh, estimated budget. You have meetings, let's say, with 20 participants, 30 participants, and we would like to see which were these participants. We would like we we can request at any time additional information uh, during this reporting uh, period, and we can request uh, this list of participants in order to prove the attendance of the of the sessions and or of the meetings. So yes, it is important to keep the list of participants for these meetings. Indeed, and let's uh, uh, add, not anecdotally, but by experience, that uh, since more and more meetings are now uh, uh, online, if you have online meetings, uh, you can save some efforts uh, not to create minutes, but you just uh, keep the records of the online meeting. This is perfectly possible with uh, the contemporary tools we are all using. We certainly encourage this as a good, uh, relatively new practice. Uh, next question, and apparently, it, uh, George, you are, uh, you are occupying the agenda when we answer questions. One presentation states that the grant agreement, the grant management system is used only by coordinators, but the system is used by beneficiary for financial reports. Uh, well, let me give an advance. Uh, the IT system we uh, uh, developed uh, is uh, a collaborative tool Coordinator retains that the coordinator role is a conductor. Uh, means a coordinator has the ultimate right to uh, release, submit, and reject reports when it goes for preparation. The same applies for amendments. And actually, in all process, what you see is uh, more or less the replication of how you already experienced the grant agreement preparation. So the same stands true, uh, and there is an ultimate role for the coordinator. However, this is a collaboration based tool and certainly beneficiaries have their role. George, I'm looking at you. Uh, would you elaborate on, on a bit uh, who, who should do what when it goes for reporting? Yes, uh, as you remember in the validation process of your organization, you have all, all the beneficiaries, they have a legal representative which needs to be nominated by the organization in order to be fully valid in our uh, uh, IT systems. So this legal rep representative of a beneficiary 
as this role of uh, submission to the coordinator level of the financial statement. So each beneficiary will submit a financial statement, will insert information in the financial statement, submit it to coordinator. Of course, the coordinator at his level, at her level, she has this right, this possibility to check the data, to ask for additional clarifications from uh, uh, beneficiaries and at the end to sign in the name of the consortium and to submit this uh, financial statement to EU. So yes, there is a role of you as a beneficiary in terms of financial reporting. There is also a role in terms of technical reporting to EU. And then the, f the coordinator has the role to check this data, to ask for clarification from your side and to submit the package to EU. And again, common sense prevails. Uh, if there are proprietary informations that are uh, characterizing the activities or reflecting the activities of a beneficiary, then these need to be prepared by the beneficiary and be submitted first to the coordinator. The coordinator compiles these crucial pieces of information together, equally stands true not only for the financial reports, but also for the technical one. And once the picture is deemed complete by the coordinator, the coordinator has the ultimate right to submit it to the EU services. So these are the two layers and also the segregations in terms of which piece of information is owned by which. Certainly the coordinator uh, cannot and will not have a say when individual beneficiaries build the individual financial statements. Very important on the technical part, it's a genuine collaborative work and each uh, beneficiary and everyone in the consortium has a role to play there. Uh, we move on. I see we have still uh, very good questions uh, from Andrea. I see a uh, well upvoted question. Uh, is again reporting, George, will be for you. If a beneficiary incurs in a delay, like one month, in releasing a deliverable, do we need to communicate this delay with an amendment or within the periodical report? George? Yes, thank you again for the question. Yeah, it may happen that the deliverable is delayed with one or two months. Uh, the first step, uh, and again, the common sense, is to inform the project officer about to anticipate this delay and to inform in time the project officer by email also about the delay, to explain the situation, to explain the reasons for such a delay. There is no need for a certain amendment for a delay of one or two months of deliverables. If the deliverables are delayed, let's say, with one year or a longer period, then there is another situation and another discussion. And these delays of deliverables should be, uh, like you said very well in the question, it should be um, mentioned in the periodic report in the deviations, uh, in the section related to the deviations from the provisions of the grant agreement. So you can say deliverable 4.1 was delayed two months because due to the um, field activities, the seasonal, the seasonal vegetation, we could not collect the data in time and the reports would not be delivered in time, something like this. So it should be mentioned in the periodic report. Yes, of course. Thank you, George. Um, maybe I can add, uh, uh, it's not an anecdote, it's, it's by experience. Uh, please, this is why we insist that uh, you apply and follow the principle of transparency and collegiality, because delays do not come from out of the blue. You can anticipate it and therefore inform and also uh, prepare, prepare uh, in uh, line with the context. Why I'm saying this? Well, might be the case that there are deliverables that are relatively proportionate to the overall action. The delay of the deliverable, of the given deliverable, in this case, may have a mitigated impact on the overall performance of the project. However, if a deliverable uh, entails a substantial part of the action of the project, in this case, you can well anticipate the need to amend the grant agreement and even uh, extend certain periods because of the scale of the delay or because of the very substance of the given uh, deliverable. Therefore, know your work, know and identify and locate where you are in your planning and please be always uh, consistent in communicating any unforeseen events in your project to your project advisor and primarily if you are a beneficiary, first of all, to the coordinator. 
I'm looking to the next question. We have still ample of time to answer from Margarita. Uh, how does the Commission monitor the exploitation of the project results after the ending of the grant? Uh, Jani, I think this is more for you. Yeah. Thank you, Attila. Um, well, the monitoring comes from, from two, uh, let's say, I would say there are two ways to that Commission was doing it and will, will do it. So the first is the continuous reporting. As George said, the continuous reporting is on from the day one of your project but it doesn't close at the end of your project. It continues until four years after the end of your project to stay on, just for you to uh, provide to the Commission anything that you have done on your exploitation and your dissemination activities. And this is actually a residual obligation from your model grant agreement. So please pay attention, do not forget that. Now, is it true that all projects or coordinators actually upload this kind of information? The answer is no, some of them do, some of them don't. So Commission needs to come and check what are you doing in your exploitation uh, activities. So what changed in Horizon Europe is the following. We say that um, the follow-up period of the four years needs to be split in three. The first, year after the, um, the first year after the end of the project, if no exploitation takes place, then every project needs to use the Horizon Results platform and uh, not publish, I mean, do not make public, but make visible, make known that you have a specific or more exploitable re results that need to go to the Horizon Results platform. That is one year after the end of the project. The idea is to come back to the projects, even if you're using the Horizon Results platform, two years after the end of the project with a very, very small and concise questionnaire about what happened with your exploitation plans and if you need any help or any support to take these plans into the next step. And the same questioner can actually close the after the end of the project four year period. So after the four years you've been asked, and again, this the idea is to have this in the continuous reporting, uh, so it will not be something that you will receive ad hoc. Um, of course, this is not yet uh, fi finalized. We're working with our colleagues in the implementing uh, bodies to see how the best, how best this, this questionnaire can actually be tailored for you. The overall idea is also to receive a results ownership list and to receive a list of exploitable results into your reporting, and especially in the final reporting of the projects, which gives a very good idea of what exactly you managed to achieve during the project lifetime. So it is very important to, um, to know exactly what, what you have have these results handy, reporting to the Commission, and let the Commission know whether you need any help. Horizon Results Platform is an excellent tool for expressing your needs. What is your need for the further exploitation? Of course, a final way to Commission to check that is through audits. But this is not something that we would like to use as a, as a let's say, penalizing tool coming back to you. What Commission wants is to be able for you to do the maximum with, with your results, with your IP, and exploit them as you have planned in your exploitation and dissemination plans, and of course, maximize the value coming out of that and investment in your project. Thank you, Jan. Uh, let me echo your, your closing words. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, trust and collegiality prevails uh, when it goes for uh, checking obligations. Uh, nevertheless, we have massing, massive monitoring tools. We also use data mining, uh, and uh, soon uh, we will more and more exploit uh, artificial intelligence because we have now a huge uh, uh, database, uh, monstrous uh, data based on the submitted uh, informations. And also, let's not hide uh, when we talk about the trust and collegiality that uh, the RNI community is one. So it's all about your own reputation, ensuring that you comply and uh, you, you deliver against the uh, words of the Modern Grant Agreement. This also uh, means that you safeguard your own reputation. Certainly not because uh, uh, you have recurrent uh, participation, but this is a big community where networks and long-lasting relations uh, uh, count, and therefore uh, reputation remains uh, important, not only for us, but hopefully also for all participants and beneficiaries. Uh, 
whenever you, you go into details, you know, I must say uh, the topic of uh, IPR and valorization is, is gaining just more and more grants, uh, and I'm amazed to see the substance. Uh, uh, I think uh, this just confirms how good these events are, like this coordinator day. Colleagues, we still have a few questions. I'm uh, looking at uh, colleagues uh, uh, to feature one. Uh, Andrea is a, a recurrent uh, uh, question uh, uh, placer. I think at the end we may award uh, a, a uh, 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 we may award this with something. Uh, good questions means great interest, and it is a, a good confirmation for us that we are pointing into the good direction. Question relates to milestones. In case milestones achieved, do we need to flag the achievement and attach the milestone document in the periodic report, or uh, there is something else to do? Um, George? Yes, thank you. It's a very good question. Yes, yeah, sometimes milestones are not very well uh, flagged, and uh, there are no supporting documents in uh, some periodic reports related to this milestone. It's just a, sen a sentence that the milestone was achieved. And that's why the question is very good, because indeed, we have to, to flag this in the system, in, uh, in, uh, in the portal, but also we have to provide supporting documents in order to understand how the milestone was achieved. And uh, the best way to provide this uh, information inside the periodic report about the milestones, but also a supporting document as an annex for, for the periodic report. So it is important to have the proof of achievement and also to see clearly that the milestone was uh, achieved. Thank you, George. Um, your answer makes me uh, uh, remind about uh, what we call quality of reporting. Very often we see that project activities are excellent. They really point uh, towards achievements, while sometimes the reports, in particular the individual parts, are not up to the, the required quality. So we definitely recommend, and this could be also a good takeaway before we close this panel, that we definitely recommend to our newcomers in particular to pay attention to the quality of reports and devote time to write a good, concise report. And quality we do not measure in the lengths of technical reports, but on the substance and the clarity. One more question maybe before we wrap up. Uh, uh, it's regarding amendment. Does an amendment have to be made even if only the timeline is moved, but not the content of the milestones and work packages. So delay on milestones and work packages. Uh, George, your take? Uh, yes, thank you again. This is a tricky question because <clears throat> for the amendments, there are several conditions which should be met. And uh, in this, uh, this question includes uh, on one side a change of timelines but I th in many cases, the changing of timelines is also uh, due to several reasons. And these reasons can be also linked to the changes in work packages. And indeed, if there is a change in the work packages, if there is a change in the task, if there is a change in the efforts of the beneficiaries which are implementing the action, in that moment, there is also a need uh, to include this in, an, in the amendment. So it's not only about the time, the amendment, it's also about the changes in the work packages and in the tasks, because uh, many times uh, the changes are more complex. It's not only on, on one side. And that's why the situation should be discussed first case by case with the project officer. You should inform the project officer by email. You should present the situation. And then, based on this discussion, you can go for an amendment or you can uh, just go for an information procedure in the p next periodic reporting. Thank you, George. Uh, and we have now time for the last question. Apparently, it arrives. And it's great, because I can hand the floor to Yanis to answer. What about IPR from a uh, coordinated and support action project? Is commercial exploitation applicable? How to approach exploitation of outputs from such a project? Very narrow formulated question. Yeah, but, but it's, it's a very nice question indeed. Um, um, I mean, all projects um, could have exploitable results. And um, uh, we're not talking about commercial exploitation only. The, an exploitation plan can include any forms of exploitation, any forms of valorization, any forms of value that we can create from these results. 
So when we have a CSA, basically we have CSAs in order to be able to harvest specific information from a specific call, um, group projects together in order to make a portfolio that could answer a specific policy question, or um, investigate something that cannot be investigated in a collaborative uh, uh, research project or an innovation project. So the idea behind the exploitation of CSAs is to be able the reports, the results, the outputs of these projects to be able to influence or help or educate the policy making or the decision making in a specific context. So we're talking about non-commercial exploitation without excluding that there might be commercial exploitation or something. Maybe a CSA, for example, we might have a CSA that uh, develops the principles of an awareness raising campaign, for example. That that's a design of a campaign, can be commercially exploited afterwards, can be used and reused in the market. So, although it's a CSA, can have some commercial exploitation outputs, uh, commercial exploited, sorry, outputs. Um, so in that sense, we do not exclude, exclude any parts of exploitation, but we're not only focused on commercial. Non-commercial policy-making, decision-making is also ways to valorize the knowledge coming of these projects. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, this concludes uh, this panel. Uh, George, Yanni, thank you very much for coming and for your contribution. Dear fellows, uh, I am here to announce a 10-minute break, but afterwards we will come back. We expect you back, uh, uh, so stay tuned and enjoy a 10 minutes break. Thank you.
Welcome back, fellows. Uh, we reached the fourth last panel of today's coordinator days, and I have the pleasure to have three of my dearest and closest project uh, project uh, project advisors, project colleagues, with me here. Uh, in this panel, we will address communication, dissemination, exploitation. We also call it uh, CDE. Then uh, we will uh, highlight uh, how you can contribute to shaping future RNI policies. And last but not least, uh, we will also cover a bit the bold topic of open science. And this makes me welcome here our first uh, uh, presenter, uh, Colomb Varin. Colomb is uh, a French national. She holds an MBA from the Brussels Solway uh, Business School. And what I like the most, uh, uh, besides uh, her bold expertise uh, in uh, communication uh, and event organization in the field of biodiversity, that uh, uh, Colomb uh, likes to give lectures back uh, in her alma mater in uh, Sciences Po Paris. Uh, welcome, uh, Colomb. For is yours. We talk about uh, dissemination, exploitation, and communication. That is always good. Please. Thank you, Attila. Yes, indeed. So I will cover these three topics, and let me begin by some definitions and something important. Communication is part of the grant agreement that you have signed, most of you, for Horizon Europe, for your new project in Horizon Europe. It's under this uh, article, and I'd like to begin by that, Article 17. So you have to do communication and dissemination in your project, and I will explain how and how also you, we can help you to do so. On this slide, I would insist on this Article 17.2, which is about the visibility of your, or your project. Everything that you do regarding outside activities, communication, any products that you will uh, do for your presentation, please use this EU emblem together with a shorter sentence compared to Horizon 2020, because I'm sure we have Horizon 2020 projects also uh, former coordinators or current coordinators uh, around the, uh, out, out, out there. So uh, it's only with this sentence funded by the European Union. But this is binding as it is part of your grant agreement. Secondly, I wanted to insist on the little journey that you have to go when we, when we, go when we talk about communication, dissemination, and exploitation. Already at the level of your proposal, you have presented a draft communication strategy plan or dissemination and exploitation strategy plan. So let me go quickly through the different steps that, we, that you have for this plan. First, of course, the situation analysis. Most of you have done it and very well because you are here today. Then uh, identify and mapping the different target audiences that your project will address to. Uh, thirdly, what are the key messages? And of course, those messages will evolve during the time frame of your project. And very importantly, the two other steps are the tools and the channels that you will use. So some tools are yours, and some tools are also tools and channels from us, from the European Commission, where we can help you with. And I will. I will elaborate a bit uh, further about that. And finally, very importantly, the evaluation and with the different KPIs and that was already in your proposal and now in your project. When I said uh, that you have different target audiences to map and to identify, I would insist that they are different according to uh, the three elements that I just presented. When it comes to communication, obviously it's uh, beyond the pro your project own community. It's really about what we call the general public, the citizens, but also the media. So the message has to be straight, clear, and very well understandable. When it comes to dissemination, which comes when you have the use of the results of your, pro of your research project, it's more to the scientific community, but you can also have messages, uh, depending on the research field where you are in, um, directed to the industrial partners or to the policy makers. And finally, very importantly, and my colleague Yanis insisted on that, the exploitation that we are really much looking for, uh, that is really uh, regarding commercial, but not only, uh, also uh, other aspects. Which, um, yes, sorry, which tools and channels we recommend for your own, um, the, the implementation of communication CDE, let's put it simple. 
We have uh, identified these different elements that, of course, in your work package are present most of the time, the work package um, leading, uh, dealing with uh, CDE, audiovisual uh, creation, digital, face-to-face, -face and print. Print, as you know, we don't recommend so much anymore, first because we are in cluster six, which is, of course, uh, a sustainable cluster. And so we really want to keep it to the essential, if really necessary. Face-to-face -face, uh, is something that, indeed, during the two and a half years, we, we did less and less. But for some of your projects, it's really important. When we come to demos, when we come to focus groups, we need these aspects. And so we don't have to neglect it. Also, for larger conferences like this one, we also uh, favor digital. Um, and all the other aspects from creation and audiovisuals are elements that you already have in your proposal and that you, in the strategy, in the strategic plan that you will build, you will envisage which are the ones uh, that you will use. But now, very importantly, how us at the European Commission, we can help you. We have different elements for that. So the first one is, is called CORDIS and most of you know it. Because at the beginning of your project, you receive a nice article drafted by the journalist from Cordis about your own um, project. What can happen as well during the time frame of your project is that your project, as Paul Webb said at the very beginning, can cluster with other projects in the same field. And it can result in what we call, in our little jargon, the Cordis Results Pack, which is a very nice gathering of different projects' uh, input and results uh, through um, articles. And that is published, of course, on the Cordis um, website. Secondly, how can we help you as well? Through the Horizon magazine that I imagine most of you know. And we have different thematic uh, uh, according to the year. And you can be invited by your project officer to um, have your project presented and present in the Horizon magazine, which has a huge dissemination. So it's also another element for the, important for you to know. And finally, I would say on this slide, the success stories, what we call the success stories, are mainly after, I would say, the first half of, of the first uh, reporting period at least, when you have really some results to showcase and that they are really important. This can be raised at the level of success stories. The success stories are obviously on the Europa website, but they can also be used by the different briefing of our directors, director general, or during the different business trips that they do. So this is very relevant as well. Last but not least, social media. I'm very keen myself in social media, and I know most of you have already a Twitter account when you just begin the project, so that's uh, congratulations for that. We do have as well at REA two Twitter accounts, the one from the European Research Executive Agency on, and the one from the EU Green Research, which is really one focusing on cluster six projects. So don't hesitate to use, to tag us, uh, even at the very beginning of the project. And together with your project officer, during the time frame of your project, we are happy to give visibility to your project through these two uh, Twitter accounts. Now, coming to maximize the impact of your project, I will not go in further detail first because my colleague Victoria later on will, will also tackle that, and also because my colleague Yanis did that very well at the beginning. But Horizon Results Booster, this is a free of charge support that the European Commission gives to your project in order to boost the exploitation potential of your research results. So this is during the time frame of your project. Now, the Horizon Results platform that also Yanis mentioned is important when you have key results to present. This can be during the time frame of your project or this can be, as Yanis said, after the end of your project. And then the Horizon Impact Award, and you may know that uh, next week at the RNI days, uh, some uh, Horizon Impact Awards will be given for Horizon 2020 projects. So this normally, it will come in a while because it's at the end really of your project, that some projects can be awarded uh, an amount of 25,000 euros in order to continue boosting uh, the uh, showing and boosting the impact and the results of your projects. With that, I'm finishing my presentation with two takeaway messages. The first one, never forget, please, to um, acknowledge the EU funding in your projects with this uh, EU flag and the short sentence. And as I think Paul said, and Attila also said different than George, uh, stay in close contact with your project officer. That's the best way to have a good communication, uh, dissemination and exploitation um, success for your project. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kolob, uh, for this 
rather colorful presentation, uh, we should not uh, emphasize enough how important it is to communicate and going beyond uh, the closer box of uh, the consortium and the project. Uh, as uh, announced earlier, now we go on our habit, we spare our questions and your questions and the answers at the end of this panel. Uh, meanwhile, we, we keep moving. Uh, when we talk about research and innovation policy, your voice is very important. Not only your voice, but uh, everything that is uh, an output or a substance or an experience out of your project. Therefore, we would like to highlight uh, how we see your role in shaping uh, future RNI policies. For this purpose, I welcome here uh, my colleague Victoria Beas Dago. Victoria uh, has a background in uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, I like very much the fact that she likes uh, oceans, uh, 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 coastal areas, she likes uh, uh, swimming and diving. But besides this, uh, she has a background in marine biology and maritime affairs uh, and uh, almost one and a half decade experience in uh, program and project implementation uh, inside uh, the EU institutions. And besides the fact that Victoria is one of our senior uh, project advisors in the field of uh, biodiversity, she takes part in uh, our internal machinery dealing with uh, feedback to science and science policy. And nothing left but to hand the floor to Victoria to explain you the insights and our expectation and vision about feedback to policy. Victoria. Many thanks uh, Attila and good late morning to all the project uh, participants. I will pick it up a bit where my colleague Colom uh, parked it. She was talking about exploitation, the concrete use of project results and I will focus a little bit on exploiting for policy purposes. And why do we have this in today's coordinators meeting? We think it's very important for you to reflect on this since the very beginning. You don't have to leave it till the end. So the idea is to capture, harvest the results from your pro projects for RNI policy, EU policies and beyond. So my focus of the presentation will be mainly be around three things. So why? Is it important? What do we mean and how do you do it and how we can help you? So just to say, set the scene a little bit, uh, exploitation, uh, also Yanis related to it and Colom, is concrete use of project results. So uh, for this case is for policy purposes. Policy is a complete window of opportunities. There's a huge many, many areas that you can tap in and contribute with your projects. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at the end of the project. So this is really the use of the knowledge, your scientific outcomes and results to feed into evidence-based policy making. You see in the slide a, a graph, it's a nice circle because policy, sorry, I go back, it's a circle. You can see that you can uh, tap in in many, many different areas. Of course, for RNI projects, one key area is in policy design. So when you go ahead in your research projects, you will identify knowledge gaps. It's very important that those knowledge gaps are harvested, you picked up and communicated forward. They can feed into next web programs. That's one area. For cluster six, we have a lot of legislation in environment. So an area you can tap in is also into policy implementation in all the different directives, etc. And a third area is also in the valuation. Uh, we have ongoing many, many, many cycles on revisions of directives, etc., impact assessments, stakeholder consultations. So this is a concrete area that you can also uh, tap into. So have the, the full picture and see where you can contribute. And again, I reflect on it. You can do it since the very beginning of your project. Now, going a bit of why it is important, I think all the way through today's coordination meeting, it became uh, very clear that Horizon Europe is a new program that has evolved since Horizon 2020, but a lot of focus is on impact. Now, exploitation is an obligation in Horizon Europe, and you saw when you had to apply to the proposals that there's a big focus on uh, impact and the pathways towards impact. You had to elaborate on this. So why it is important is to contribute to EU priorities. Horizon Europe, it's uh, supporting EU, is EU funding. And really, there's been a big exercise being put into the work programs to 
map out what are the priorities of the EU and this has been translated into the topics and is the impact you have to deliver on. So this is also on the EU policy priorities that I have a slide. Secondly, uh, RNA investments must deliver EU added value and this is for the benefit of people and planet. In Horizon Europe, there's three impacts that have been identified, scientific impact, societal and economic. So you have to reflect on this all the way through. And thirdly, the impact from your projects, you work on the ground and very concrete thematic areas. So really do that exercise, reflect and identify where you can contribute and deliver and also fill those knowledge gaps. In, in today's uh, presentation, we didn't want to, it's not a, a policy presentation, but uh, to set the scene, uh, the European Green Deal in 2021, it's the new compass that is guiding us. And also we have in the international agenda, the UN uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development. So the European Green Deal aims to achieve climate neutrality uh, by 2050, and also has set a new way in the Commission to interlink many of the different policies. So the idea is to work together towards one direction, climate, biodiversity, food security. In the screen, you see some of the policy, grand policy areas that are very important for Cluster 6. In particular, the biodiversity strategy, farm to fork, zero pollution, etc. So do plug in and reflect on this in your area, in this Cluster 6, and the grand picture we are all aiming to contribute to. One short slide, many of you might have been got acquainted with the European missions. Uh, there's been already many info days on them and you can go directly to each of the mission websites. But this is a new way of uh, delivering in r &I and beyond. The focus is to really have target, very ambitious goals and deliver in a short time frame, 2030. So the EU has done a bit of a strategic analysis and five areas have been identified in this cycle to really aim to deliver by 2030. So really tap into this in your projects, connect. They are very active, all the missions in, uh, in the different forms. And uh, for example, the mission Oceans, recently there's a charter that all the projects can, uh, can sign, contribute, how your projects are delivering. And the mission Soil, we, I think we have many uh, projects also from the first course of the mission Soil. So really uh, connect to the mission oceans. That is a new way of doing R&I &I and more connected on the ground and delivering results in the short time frame. So now a bit set after setting the scene, I want to just keep send a few messages on how. It could look simple, but it's not to deliver on the, on the policy side. And I insist again, you have to start from day one. That's why we also have this presentation today. So first, connect to relevant policies and developments at the local, national, regional, EU and global level. I give a bit of the frame, but I think a policy brief could serve a purpose, but you need to further engage. You need to do this from the beginning. There's many uh, stakeholder consultations on various things that are ongoing, and then many of the um, directives and legislation they have, thematic working groups, EU expert groups, reach out, go to your member states, because there is where a lot of the technical work happens. Of course, you can also reach and connect to the commission services, the environment, RTD, MAR, etc. But also to influence policy, you have to technically go down and work uh, at, at more focused areas. And don't, don't forget also at the international level. My second message is team up, collaborate, work together, and very importantly, capitalize. Please take stock. So when you're starting your projects, sorry, one, one step back, do take your time to reflect, okay, what other projects have, are out there in my area? What have they done? Don't start, don't reinvent the wheel and just go uh, take a little bit of time Ask us, the project officers, go to the Horizon Results platform. Their projects, when they end, they put the key exploitable results, including for policy purposes, and take your time. And please dedicate resources. In the proposal, you could have put a, a task on collaboration opportunities, but really this requires a lot of time. You need to, and working with other projects, to understand what they're doing, to see, okay, what are the overlaps, what, what can we do together? This requires time. So really invest and dedicate resources. 
and work together to have a credible package. And also use uh, your consortium and the, your existing networks. You, the, the consortia in your projects are, are very good. You're, as Colombo was saying, you've succeeded and they're very well connected and could be in other projects as well. So really use uh, the networks. So key message, team up, uptake of research results to be able to, to deliver, including, of course, in the policy front. Last two things on how to do it. Plan for it. Uh, this was picking up both what my colleague was saying. Uh, Colomb on exploitation planning. You have to plan also to deliver on the policy front from the very beginning. Make it strategic. What are the key areas we can target? And make sure it's adaptive. You need to be able to adapt to a changing policy landscape. And again, join forces. And this requires also planning and how to join forces. My last point is integrate this very well in your project implementation. If you leave this until the end with a policy brief, this is not good enough. A final science to project meeting is not good enough. Build it in your project implementation since the very beginning. Talk to us, have a policy science meetings, review meetings, clustering meetings, report on it. Some projects we heard that uh, publish some publications and contribute to, for example, IP IPCC report. We didn't know, tell us, this is a concrete result, how your project is feeding into policy, including international agenda. So really embed this in your project implementation. Uh, a little bit like George was explaining that uh, it's very important that this is part of the work plan. And how can we help you? I will just to, to sum up say, uh, we are here to help you. I think you've heard it all along the way, your project officers. There's a lot of guidance also on exploiting for policy purposes. Uh, the Horizon Results platform, I think, has this dual role that you can show your results, but you can also use to see where you are starting, not to duplicate and to not uh, uh, reinvent the wheel. And we are also a bit of a bridge with the policy officers, so we can also make links with them and act up a bit as a liaison with the different commission services. In the long slide that you have in the, um, in the portal, there's more information on the Horizon Results platform that you can use. There's also a link with the missions that you can flag your results to the mission, how to uh, upload your results. So do look at the, at the slides uh, on the Horizon Results platform. So finally, my key messages is dedicate time, invest in how your projects contribute to, to feed into policy processes. Be strategic, start from day one, keep us regularly informed and do share this within your consortium. I think project officers, we will also insist this in kickoff meetings, um, but to, to maximize uh, the results of your projects in the policy front, you have to plan for it. So do share with the consortium because everybody has a share on this in the consortium. So all the best uh, for your starting of the projects. And thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I think uh, it is difficult to complement, uh, maybe just to repeat, uh, whatever, whenever and whatever you are doing, your primary contact point is always a project advisor in our uh, agency, in our services. Always reach out, be it an advice, an information, a report. A project advisor is part of your professional network. That's the best to say. Uh, it's showing the importance of uh, policy feedback and your voice in shaping the policy. One of the best examples is actually our last topic today, uh, open science. Uh, open science arose somewhere at the start of the previous framework program, somewhere in 2023-24. And based on the feedback we received, it shaped a lot and evolved into where we are now. And this is our last presentation for today. And please join me in welcoming uh, my colleague uh, Alberto Pozza. Alberto is an uh, engineer in background. Uh, he is one of our senior project uh, advisors dealing with biodiversity, nature-based solution project. And his portfolio entails uh, not only Horizon Europe projects, but uh, we have a large uh, basket of Horizon 2020 run, uh, uh, running projects. 
this is why uh, it's a unique period when two programs uh, uh, overlap because it's, it's an additional opportunity uh, to build networks and uh, enhance synergies between projects and project results. Uh, Alberto, um, the floor is yours and in personally uh, I can only say that looking forward to learn where are now with open science and how open science takes a manifest shape under Horizon Europe. Please. Thank you Attila and good morning. So in this presentation I will highlight uh, the main aspects of open science in uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, I start saying that uh, in Horizon Europe uh, uh, we move from uh, uh, the concept of open access to the one of open science. Indeed in Horizon Europe open science becomes structural in all its aspects and uh, it is something that is mainstream from uh, the evaluation phase uh, to the implementation. And uh, this is because the European Commission, as uh, the funding entity of Horizon Europe, uh, gives uh, high importance in uh, sharing uh, scientific results as soon as possible and uh, in making them uh, accessible. And with this, the aim is to uh, increase the quality and efficiency of research and uh, to accelerate the advan advancement of knowledge and finally to have a higher impact on uh, society. In uh, Horizon Europe there are some mandatory open science practices and some recommended ones. All these are uh, listed and explained in uh, relevant documents like uh, in the Horizon Europe program guide and in the Horizon Europe annotated grant agreement. Uh, in Annex 5, there, there are details, descriptions. And um, so um, it's important to <clears throat> start thinking about open science already at the proposal stage, because during evaluation, the mandatory open science practices, the presence in your uh, proposal will be assessed. And uh, the presence of recommended practices uh, can be awarded uh, in evaluation. And um, so uh, mandatory open science practices are related to open access to data, uh, data research management, uh, open access to publication, uh, while uh, recommended ones uh, include, for example, the use of uh, preprints, open peer review, and involvement of uh, other uh, relevant uh, actors in this uh, process. So I go uh, a bit in detail uh, on the different uh, practices uh, concerning peer review scientific publications. Uh, there are um, obligations regarding this. Uh, the first one is to deposit uh, the peer review uh, publication in a trusted repository as soon as uh, uh, it has been uh, published. So at the latest at uh, the date of um, publishing it, uh, it must be deposited in a trusted repository. Moreover, immediate open access via the repository must be given to the uh, peer review publication. So here is the first um, difference uh, compared to Horizon 2020, because in Horizon 2020, uh, there was the possibility of having an embargo period of uh, six months in general, uh, that was called uh, green uh, open access, but in Horizon Europe uh, it's not the case anymore. Uh, the publication must be open access uh, as immediate, immediately. Uh, moreover, um, information about uh, research output tools and instruments that are needed to validate uh, the conclusion of the scientific publication have to be um, provided through the repository. Uh, concerning the mm, uh, venue uh, where you decide to publish uh, your peer review scientific publication, you can choose the venues, the venues you, you want. Uh, however, in Horizon Europe, the fees are reimbursable only if uh, the venue is full open access, not a hybrid one. Uh, so a hybrid venue is uh, a venue where a part of the scholarity is uh, open access, while art is uh, accessible only uh, through a subscription or paying fees. 
and uh, in these venues, if you publish in these venues, you can do it. Uh, uh, of course, you have to give uh, immediate open access through the repository, but uh, the publishing fees are not uh, uh, reimbursable. Um, I just remind that uh, there is the possibility for Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe uh, beneficiaries to publish at no cost in Open Research Europe, that is the European Commission Open Access Publishing Platform. And I will come back on this uh, in the uh, following slides. Uh, concerning uh, open, uh, open access to data. So uh, in Horizon Europe, uh, um, it's important uh, uh, the research data management. Uh, uh, the research data generated by the project uh, must be handled in line with the FAIR principles. Uh, FAIR principles meaning that uh, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So for this, you have to establish a data management plan um, in the first phases of the project. Usually, it's requested by to have the data management plan submitted by month uh, six uh, as a deliverable. And this has to be kept uh, up to date uh, during the action and um, usually some uh, updates uh, are required uh, uh, in the course of the project. Uh, moreover, there is the obligation to deposit uh, uh, the data generated in a trusted repository and ensure open access, following the principle as open as possible and as close as uh, necessary. And uh, this means that uh, if there are legitimate interests uh, uh, to be safeguarded, uh, uh, data can, uh, can be kept uh, closed, not open access. And these, for example, include uh, uh, commercial exploitation, data protection rules, privacy, trade secrets. However, if there are these um, kind of exceptions, they should be uh, listed and uh, explained in the data management plan. Um, moreover, you have to provide the information via the repository about uh, uh, any research output tools and instruments that are needed to reuse and validate the data. So there is some difference compared to Horizon 2020. In Horizon 2020, uh, the obligation to uh, provide open access to research data was for the project that uh, was were uh, in the open research data pilot while in Horizon Europe, uh, it's uh, compulsory for all the projects. There can be additional open science practices uh, required, for example, uh, by the call uh, itself. These can include uh, validation of scientific publication by providing access to data other than the one generated by the project, uh, uh, but for example, previous data that uh, are needed to validate the conclusions of uh, uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications. Uh, however, also in this case, uh, legitimate interests uh, uh, can uh, be applied. Or in case of public emergency, a uh, beneficiary must, uh, if they are requested by the granting authority, uh, immediately deposit uh, any research output in a repository and provide open access under uh, Creative Common uh, Attribution or Creative Common uh, Public Domain licenses. In any case, if you have doubts about obligation, you can always reach uh, your project officer. About Open Research Europe, uh, uh, this is a peer review publishing platform that is free for beneficiaries of Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020. So it's not a repository, it's a publishing platform. It uh, used the model of post-publication peer review and uh, publication and review reports are uh, made open access. Uh, this platform supports uh, our open access policy. So if you publish in Open Research Europe, you automatically uh, comply with the requirements of uh, Horizon Europe and uh, the um, publications once uh, they go to the peer review process and they are accepted, they are 
sent to a repository Zenodo. This is leading by example in uh, oper operationalizing open science principles uh, within scientific publishing, and they contribute to transparency as, and cost effectiveness and explore sustainable open access publishing business models. So to conclude, some takeaway messages. In Horizon Europe, there's no distinction between gold and green open access, but the immediate open access for peer review publication must be provided through the repository. So no embargo is allowed anymore. The data management plans are mandatory and data must be made as open as possible and uh, as close as necessary. Uh, cost eligibility for uh, peer review scientific publication is uh, only when you publish in full open access venues. So uh, open access is not an ob obligation to publish and it's not a mandate uh, not to protect uh, your project results. And um, the recommendation is to act from the beginning of the project to implement the infrastructure to uh, have uh, all the open science uh, requirement uh, implemented in your project. Uh, and of course, do not hesitate to contact your project officer uh, when you are uh, for any doubt uh, or for any inquiry. So thank you. Alberto, thank you very much. Um, Watching your presentation, I think uh, it is fair to say that I should acknowledge that um, uh, peer-reviewed publishing is a business on its own. Therefore, uh, it is not easy to change the paradigm because uh, the open uh, uh, science uh, policy uh, has an ultimate goal to change this paradigm and move towards uh, uh, openness, as you well described in your presentation. Certainly not easy. I see perfectly well that uh, now the hardwired requirements, as we see in Horizon Europe, uh, can uh, very well uh, coexist uh, uh, with uh, the market-driven uh, peer-reviewed publishing and uh, bring uh, uh, mutual benefits and some complementarity as well. We have plenty of time and therefore we move towards questions because I'm pretty sure and looking back in the previous one that we have plenty of interesting questions and I will continue to read them out aloud. Let's see the first and most upvoted one. Uh, it is data management. Uh, can you give me more details about how, the how to implement the data management plan DMP? The online template is quite confusing and raises doubts on its importance. We take your comment uh, as a, a quality benchmark and we will look at this uh, template. Uh, colleagues who wish to answer this question, it's, I take it more as a remark. Alberto, maybe? Yes, I can spend a few words about uh, this. So, um, as you indeed uh, um, write, uh, uh, there is a, a template for the data management plan in uh, among the reference documents for Horizon Europe. And uh, these uh, should be taken as a, a template where you can uh, uh, include uh, all uh, your uh, uh, information related to data management plan. But it's important that you explain in this document uh, uh, that uh, it's clear and uh, uh, for, for us, but also for you, uh, it must be clear how, which kind of data you, you plan to generate uh, uh, how uh, you are going to handle this data, which uh, format, which uh, uh, database, uh, uh, databases uh, you are using, and where you are uh, planning to uh, upload this data to, to which uh, repository. And um, so uh, it's important that when you draft this, you have uh, in, uh, in mind clearly uh, what are the targets, and the target is to uh, to uh, to see how you handle the data and there are the fair principles to uh, that you have to keep in mind uh, you have to uh, show how this uh, data will be uh, in accordance with uh, the fair principles they should be findable interoperable uh, accessible and reusable and um, yeah, that's uh, the comment I have um, concerning this. But of course, then if you have uh, 
more specific question on the particular case, you, have, you can um, come uh, raise this question also to the project officer and discuss with uh, him or her. Thank you, Alberto. So the content matters less the template itself is a fair message to say. We move on to the next question, please. As questions come in, yes. Uh, should, that's really a question for you, uh, Colomb, should funding signs, means the logo, the EU logo, also be used in Instagram posts? have time to say that during my presentation important in the little presentation at on the top of your Instagram Twitter uh, or Instagram or a Twitter account please indicate that it is an EU funded project uh, and now when it comes to Instagram I think we have all different practices of Instagram I do favor to use this little EU flag for example instead of putting EU you put the flag for funded project, and I strongly encourage that. I also strongly encourage, uh, of course, using the hashtags that you have uh, on the screen of um, on the website of this uh, coordinators day. And I also uh, really favor in Twitter, for example, to use anything to tag uh, either the European Research Executive Agency or the European Commission or Horizon Europe itself. So please. Do that as much as possible. Um, definitely, uh, yes, this, the EU sign should be there. Thank you. Thank you, Colomb. Uh, we can move to the next question. Who is the target audience of the policy briefs? Is it basically European Commission officials or are other policy makers included? Uh, Victoria? Communicate. This is why I said before that you have to be very clear on what is your message and who is your target audience. Depending on the content you have, it could be for EU policymakers, it could be for the member states. I mean, contributing to policy is at uh, EU, international, member states, regional, local, you, you name it. So imagine you want to contribute to, I don't know, marine protected area design in, in the UK then maybe you want to develop a policy brief to target that member state or the relevant authorities. If you want to contribute to something else at the EU level, then you target it to the EU uh, relevant commission services. So it's for you to decide what is the message you are passing that you want to influence policy, and then you target your, your audiences on that basis. So first think of the message and then the, the audience. It's the same as communication dissemination, in, that's the same also for policy purposes. I think we should say everywhere, everywhere. multi-level. Uh, and certainly, please always consider regional authorities, uh, member state authorities, because whatever uh, you feed there, this will also reach uh, EU uh, higher level uh, decisions uh, in an appropriate uh, leverage. So very important. The regional and national level leverage is extremely important. Don't be monochromatic and think only about uh, uh, the Commission as uh, policy maker. Uh, use the entire landscape. This is, I think, the right what, uh, message we can convey. We can move on to the next question, colleagues, um, regarding uh, instructions for the DMP for uh, coordinated and support actions, whether we have special, uh, special uh, instructions uh, filling out the data management plan. Uh, the question is uh, imminent because uh, the official template works in a case of the research innovation action. Uh, Aperto, maybe. Yes. Um, it always depends uh, on uh, which kind of uh, data you are planning to to generate uh, in the course of the project. So, uh, if the part of the data management plan template um, that is uh, targeted to RIA and IA uh, will not apply, if probably to CSAs. But um, uh, there are not uh, specific uh, instruction on this. You have to always think of uh, what you are going to generate and how you are going to treat uh, these data. Very clear. Uh, I am looking at the next question as it arrives into the stream. Uh, 
it is on policy, Victoria, it will be for you. Do you have policy making experts or even policy makers at the research executive agency to contact if you want help on policy making and shaping policy making exploitation? Very complex question. Thanks for this question. I think it's very useful as you go into your project. So we are project officers. We are not policy uh, officers. These are in the DGs, but we are very in touch, in close touch with them. But the key thing is that not all the projects are the same. So maybe some projects like the previous question that Yanni said, a CSA has much more focus on policy than on other projects. So not all the projects have the same impact. But uh, as part of the implementation, we do reviews. Uh, we use external experts that help us in the reviews. And uh, they are expert in the field and also know the policy areas. So this was covered a little bit by George in his presentation in implementation. And this is where uh, we take stock also of how your project is doing. The reviews aims to support you as you go forward, give you feedback and improve. And if policy uh, is an area that needs improvement, the experts will work on it. So this is very important for you to know. And they and normally in the reviews that we have, big, big recommendations is contribute to policy X, Y, Z since the reporting period one. So we are not policy uh, officers. Uh, we are project officers, but we work very closely with the, um, with, the project with the policy officers in the DGs. And as Attila was presenting, in the different units, we also have different people, like uh, in my case, colleagues in other uh, cluster six units that we have horizontal activities and one is like, we call it feedback to policy, it's a bit easy jargon, but it's contributing to policy. So we in our teams can also support this and we do synthesis capitalizing and we have our own internal uh, structures to make sure that those colleagues also support other colleagues and we work more in cl co close contact with the cluster SDGs. So we have a mechanism also internally to work on that front. Indeed, colleagues, uh, you don't need to create or establish or seek a separate channel. I repeat what we already used to say in various occasions, your ultimate point of contact when it goes for your project, including uh, policy matters, is your fellow project officer, project advisor. Keep this channel. Our colleagues are competent and well equipped to uh, convey the messages, even synthesize them. And we have our internal uh, policy network to channel uh, everything that is needed from your project, acknowledging your input towards the big uh, policy pot and it's shaping future policies. We move to the next question. It is mandatory to have a repository to store derivables to make them publicly available. What certified repositories do you recommend? So concerning deliverables, um, deliverables, uh, once they are uh, submitted uh, um, and approved by us, by the agency, uh, they will be, if uh, they were set as a public deliverable, they will be automatically published in CORDIS. Uh, if uh, you, you chose that deliverable uh, as uh, being confidential, they will not uh, be published. And of course, you don't uh, have the obligation to publish it as well because uh, you don't decided that uh, it should not be a public uh, deliverable. So, uh, no, for deliverables, you don't need to store them in a separate repository. The uh, requirement uh, is uh, related to peer review scientific publications. So, uh, scientific publication that went through a process of peer review. For those, you have the obligation to um, deposit them in a trusted repository. Uh, there is not a, a list of repositories that we can recommend, but uh, trusted repositories are, can be a certified repository or can be general purpose repository or institutional repositories if they comply with uh, the requirements of being trusted repository. For uh, the definition of trusted repository, uh, you can uh, find it in uh, the Horizon Europe uh, documents, in the program guide and in the annotated model agreement, but uh, our requirements, for example, how they uh, store the data, how they ensure that the data or the publication is uh, kept uh, 
for a long time. So these, uh, you should check these requirements and see if the repository complies with uh, them. Very clear. Thank you, Alberto. I think we can uh, pick up the last question uh, for today, at least what concerns uh, the streaming. There is a recommendation about a minimum number of public deliverables in a project. Oh, very imminent question, number of deliverables. Which are the rules to decide when a deliverable is public or not? Uh, again, I, I cannot uh, hold myself back, uh, try to keep deliverables uh, in a reasonable amount but when it goes for the volume. But I let it colleagues to, to elaborate the answer. Alberto, maybe you are the popular. <laughs> okay. Um, minimum number of public deliverables. Uh, uh, no, there is not a rule uh, on this. Uh, uh, but, uh, of course, this uh, uh, is something that... Um, uh, it's not related to... This question is not related to peer-reviewed scientific publications. Uh, it's about the deliverables of the project. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, you need uh, to, to see for each deliverable if uh, you have uh, uh, valid uh, reasons to uh, keep uh, the deliverable uh, not public. Uh, and uh, in case uh, uh, there are some uh, situations uh, that are too many deliverables, uh, a large majority of deliver deliverables, you want to keep them confidential, then uh, maybe you discuss with the project officer if uh, you would be requested the reasons why and to see if uh, this reason can be considered valid or not. I don't know if you have something to no, add I, I can just uh, complement what you said by stressing that we want the deliverables, to main, all the deliverables to be public. That's really for us the minimum. Of course, in some cases, public, uh, they, they cannot be public and they have to be uh, confidential. And that is something to be discussed at the moment, normally, of the grant agreement preparation with your project officer. Because after that, it's difficult to change. But again, it's on a case-to-case -case basis, so it's difficult to, to give a general answer. But Please, public. And if I could just add, if in the case it's not public, a good practice also is to have an executive summary of that deliverable and to make it public. So this is very important. But again, hopefully most of them would be public. But if not, executive summary for that one. Public. Very valid. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, this marks the end of this panel. So I thank to my panelists uh, uh, in the order you heard them in order of appearance, uh, Colomb, Toria, Alberto, thank you. Uh, before I close this session, uh, I would like to announce a few things. First of all, uh, uh, the streaming is recorded, so you can uh, watch it later on in the same channel. We will also publish the questions and answers in the event page. Uh, you will find there also the presentations. Also, um, that's the moment to announce uh, two events. Next week, there will be the annual RNI days. We will send you the link. I encourage you to register and participate. This will be also an online event, so it is easy to tune in. You can also select from the various topics and panels there. And as uh, we announced earlier, on the 4th of October, there will be a very relevant uh, session organized by the Common Implementation Center. It's all about grant management in particular amendments hands-on and reporting and explanation of financial reporting equally hands-on. I definitely encourage you to participate. Certainly, we will also listen. Uh, this is uh, the end of this session. I would like to give some credits because that was a tremendous dream work to make this happen. I wish to thank to the professional Slido team for their work. And that's the moment to mark the great efforts and say uh, our uh, uh, sincere thanks to the staff here in the RTD TV studio. Thank you, guys. Uh, very well done. We much appreciate it. We will certainly come back to you. And uh, I would like to thank to all of our panelists. I had the pleasure to come uh, welcome them here and show to you that how uh, devoted and committed colleagues we have in the agency. You can definitely count on them. And this is what I want to say. Please count on them. Stay in touch. I want to wish you excellent uh, work in your projects. Uh, 
a lot of success with your uh, project implementation. Don't forget, this is where the fun begins. I was Attila Bertsik on behalf of the European Research Executive Agency. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for being here and good luck. Bye.